afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of IAGS, I welcome you all to this master class on thoracoscopic back surgery. This is a field which has been, uh, uh, in a nascent sense, there are lots of things that can be done by, by the VAX uh, procedure. But unfortunately, the general surgeons are unaware of most of the things that can be done. This course will introduce the general surgeons to VAX. And we have got a big about, uh, uh, array of uh, famous thoracic surgeons from all over the world. And uh, they will enlighten us about master classes. We have had a lot of master classes starting from plain gallbladder surgeries, complications. Uh, we had EF, uh, endoscopic and we had surprises in laparoscopy. And all of them had been a very successful program. And this will be another one which I hope uh, lots of general surgeons will benefit out of it. For the first speaker, I would invite Dr. Anjali Patil to start the procedure. Dr. Anjali Patil. Hello. Hello. Uh, one minute at the moment. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. We can see you. Uh, and my screen? No, not your screen. Your screen has not come yet. I don't know why it's gone off now. You have to share your screen. Yeah, but... Uh, There's a green button at the bottom which says share yes, screen. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Right. yes. sorry screen. about that. That screen, I don't know, it was sharing, it's not getting shared now. In the meantime, in, Dr. Patil, in the meantime, I would I would uh, invite Dr. Ramit Gawel, our president, to say a few words. And in the meantime, you start to uh, sort it out. Raman, would you please come in? Thank you, Sainda. I thought you have forgotten the president. No, 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 I didn't. No, no, no. How Thanks can I forget the president? Thanks for remembering okay. me. How can so, you forget the president? So, thank you so much. Thanks to all the faculty who have joined. I am really, uh, uh, you know, so happy to see you all. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a rare situation for IAGS to organize a program. This program was in process for almost two years. Uh, my predecessor, Dr. Sainder Das Gupta, when he was the president last year, uh, had planned to organize this program. And for some one or the other logistical reasons, it got pushed down to this year. And then the lockdown happened. So uh, I'm glad that we are able to do it. And I'm more happy that for the program itself, that uh, because now a larger number of uh, participants can participate. When you have an on-site program like this, I believe only very hardcore thoracoscopy uh, uh, interested surgeons would attend. But now this uh, virtual program has a wide reach. We have academic collaborations with uh, the Society of Bangladesh, Society of Pakistan, Society of Maldives. And uh, they are also able to participate in this program. So this reaches beyond the borders of India. And uh, the, these four surgeons from these four nations are able to participate in this program. And that is the, the strength of a, of a digital world. As far as uh, thoracic surgery being done by or thoracoscopy being done by general surgeons, I think it's nothing new. And for me, it has an emotional chord. My father was a chest physician uh, who completed his MBBS in 48 from Agra Medical College. And he was sent by government of India those days to Switzerland for training in chest surgery because the tuberculosis was so rampant those days and uh, there were no trained chest surgeons in India. And he came back and for 25 years, as a physician, he was doing chest surgeries. 
still the time the the, the cardiac surgeries and cardiac surgeons started and thoracic surgery became more of a specialty so i think for general surgeons and especially those with laparoscopic skills it's not going to be a very difficult proposition or difficult thing to learn and it improves the the the, the scope of work for for us for us general surgeons and more so in peripheral cities and towns so i think uh, dr anjali and dr jayshree had been working really hard to organize this thoracoscopy program and dr arun prashad who has been the backbone of uh, these programs have been uh, uh, trying to push it and ultimately dr sandev who is the academic uh, chairman of this uh, iags this year uh, finalized this master class so i welcome you all the participants and i invite uh, dr anjali patel we can all see her presentation is ready to please go ahead uh, i my sincere request to all the speakers please stick to time because we want more time to participants for their question answers after their presentation thank you so much dr anjali patel uh, thank you so much dr goel and thank you dr sayandev and uh, dr jayshree torkar has not yet joined i thank her too uh this is basically going to be an applied anatomy for the general surgeons who want to do thoracoscopic surgery so we will be going right to the basics but the, we must understand that, that when we compare open versus the thoracoscopic surgery the anatomy also differs because we have to see it from the perspective of thoracoscopic surgery and not from the perspective of anti uh, from the thoracoscopic from the perspective of the open surgery so when we will discuss this anatomy in terms of surface markings which will be common as to open as well as laparoscopic the thoracoscopic then the anatomy of the axis that is more about what you are not going to injure then we as we move inside we go to the pleura pleural space the hemi and the both the hemithoraxes and the a little bit on special considerations for the lungs so surface bank, uh, markings just to uh revise them the sternal angle is at the level of the second costal cartilage is where we are counting all the ribs that's where there is the bifurcation of trachea and that also divides the superior mediastinum from the anterior middle and posterior divisions of the mediastinum and it also marks the upper border of the fibrous pericardium the other surface markings are mainly the ribs which are very important rib counting is important so that you get your ports correctly and you get your incisions correctly so uh, you have the uh, two ribs which are the first uh, seven or eight ribs and then the false ribs that are from the vertebral column to the costochondral junctions and then the last two ribs are the floating ribs um the lines that are important are the mid clavicular line the anterior mid and the posterior axillary lines and you also mark the scapula when in the position in the normal position with the uh, arm adducted as well as when it gets abducted it moves the tip of the scapula moves up a couple of spaces so it will come down to 6th or 7th intercostal space then uh, posteriorly you have the auscultatory triangle which is just medial to the scapula and below the trapezius which might which is sometimes used as a port by some of the thoracic surgeons the difference between the abdominal and the thoracic cavities is mainly that the thorax is rigid as opposed to the abdomen which is expansile so any changes any changes in pressure especially if you are using a closed system would result in the mediastinal shift so in case you are using any co2 insufflation which if you are doing a mini uh, a mini thoracotomy you would not be using that but otherwise in a closed system you have to understand the mediastinal shift and keep this co2 pressures at a very minimal uh plus in the thorax you have movements of the lung expansion the major vascular structures the beating of the heart and also the friction of structures over each other so when you are applying the clips this is important that especially the metal clips can uh, can come off because of this movement at a later stage so it has to be applied carefully in thoracoscopic surgery you are dealing with extremely fragile structures namely the lungs the membranous trachea which are likely to have air leaks if you are not careful and some of the vessels which are extremely delicate 
we go down to the anatomy of the axis because that is the first thing you are going to have to do when you have to enter the thorax what in the anatomy part you must understand the vascular bundle is supposed to be just below the rib above in the groove there but especially in the older age and a lot of patients sometimes it might be sagging it might come to the middle of the space so whatever you do you have to avoid injuring this so your entry should be careful otherwise you will have trickling of blood and the camera uh, in the camera and in the field and plus even if you've gone in carefully later on if you have too much of friction due to movement of your ports or instruments and the fulcrum effect on the ribs you could still end up injuring them and having bleeding at a later time uh, when you are entering the pleura could be adherent and can result in lung injury the third thing that when you look at the anatomy of axis is the diaphragm which when you are on the lower uh, intercostal spaces you could directly enter into the diaphragm so you must be careful out there and directly into the diaphragm could also enter into the abdominal cavity the next layer that comes is the pleura pleura might be having various uh, pathologies like adhesions lesions collections and in uh, india you have a typical indian indian scenario the that is the tubercular adhesions which make it extremely difficult to access uh, the different structures and also it results in a lot of many times um what we have to understand is that uh, when we want to access the, uh, the pleural cavity we have to allow the lung to collapse so that is the you, uh, that is you have to wait for the anesthetist gives you a good collapse of the lung by either by waiting or by suctioning in the endotracheal uh, tube uh, use of suction when you are using suction into this pleural cavity you could land up in inflating the lung at the same time especially if you are in a closed system if if, if you have a, a mini thoracotomy that is not a problem but if it is a closed system you will realize the moment you use a very powerful suction the lung will expand so you might require a little bit of co2 in those cases uh in the open anatomy everything is open like a book of course even then for an open thoracic surgery access is still difficult but it is even more so because uh, in thoracoscopic surgery because you see when you go in this is the kind of picture you see at the port you would see just the lung out there when you go in you just see the lungs there and when you go in you just see the lungs and you have to understand that anatomy in your head before you know where you want to go and what you want to do so knowledge of the thoracoscopic anatomy as well as general handling and utmost patience is the key to success thus which is the direction from which you are viewing it you could be viewing from a lateral position you could be viewing from a prone position so the, uh, the right side and the left uh, side would differ in the anatomy so if you are viewing it from the bottom part or your camera is port is from the upper part so your angle angulation of the camera would also affect the vision and the structures that you see so when you go in so you need to kind of have a mental picture what are you going to, so we, when we talk about the right thorax anatomy you have to have a mental picture about where is your lung going to be once you lift the lung anteriorly that is upwards what are the structures you are going to see it is mainly on the right side it is dominated by the azygous vein so you have the azygous vein that forms a prominent part some of the structures are common to both the right and the left that is you will see the rib structures you will see the intercostal spaces you will see the sympathetic nerves you will see the um uh, pericardium and you will see the uh, internal mammary artery so all these are common to both the right and the left and of course the diaphragm so this is going to be the these are going to be the common structures on the right and the left side and which are easy to uh, identify but on the right side what you would see is mainly the azygous vein once you have defined the azygous vein you look for the superior vena cava you will the nerves that are important is the phrenic nerve that runs onto the pericardium anterior to which will be the thymus in the upper part just behind this would be the behind the superior vena cava you have the trachea the esophagus as you come lower down you have the hilum of the lung just below the azygous vein and below the hilum of the lung you have the 
esophagus and again the aorta and the vertebral bodies the sympathetic chain would be running on the vertebral body so this is the anatomy the way you see it there on the right side so now when you going with the scope you will first identify the superior vena cava and the azygous vein out here and then when you look at the ribs you will see the sympathetic chain just above it so this is the region that you are seeing out here just behind the superior vena cava you will see the trachea the esophagus and the important nerve here will be the vagus nerve and here will be the phrenic nerve the phrenic nerve is a very important landmark as you have seen it up here it comes just medial to the root of the lung so it is very important to safeguard the phrenic nerve when you are going to the root of the lung plus you have you must understand in the upper just above the fibrous pericardium you will see the thymus gland in the upper pericardium uh, in the upper mediastinum so azygous vein just in the supra azygous part that is cranial to the azygous vein you have the esophagus and the trachea when you dissect in this region you have to be very careful because this is the area where you are going to have the vagal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve as you come to the infra azygous part that is caudal to the azygous you will see this the structures here here this is a ca esophagus so you have you are seeing a large esophagus with a mass there you have the esophagus just behind it is the aorta and then the vertebra this the lung right lung has been lifted up as you go more caudally you have the inferior inferior pulmonary ligament which you would have to cut to reach up to the hiatus here which is the where the esophagus is continuing caudally so this is your azygous the aorta and above that will be the esophagus in this area so when you dissect the esophagus away from the aorta taking all the lymph nodes you will have the direct branches of the aorta coming to the esophagus which will have to be clipped a very prominent structure on the esophagus is a vagus so especially if you have very fri a very friable esophagus it is a good idea to hold a vagus which is a which is quite a tough structure so this is now we are seeing from from the lower ports we are looking upwards so this now you have lifted up the pulmonary ligament inferior pulmonary ligament this is the right lower lobe and you can see the aorta coming down here and here the diaphragm and the hiatus will be in this age area what we want to see is the thoracic duct which is going to be in somewhere around this region so when you have to ligate the thoracic duct that is where you are going to look for it coming up again now we are coming to the azygous as i told you the hilum is related very close to the azygous so when you if you have lifted the lung up and you are looking at it posteriorly what happens is the right main bronchus is seen to be going downwards uh the uh, right main bronchus is uh, seeing being seen going upwards and the left main bronchus will be going downwards because you are visualizing them from the posterior side so that's the right main bronchus the left main bronchus and the carina and this is the azygous and this is where you are going to find the carinal nodes and this is the esophagus down here as you dissect behind the azygous that is where you will find the bronchial arteries which when you are dissecting the azygous you need to be careful not to injure them otherwise then it is better to clip them which are the branches coming directly from the aorta so as you see the aorta up as it goes up the aorta would be going you would be going to the this is the arch of aorta that is the trachea so as you know that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve will be coming from this side so when you are this is the membranous part the posterior part of the trachea that you are visualizing the right bronchus and the left bronchus and that is going to be the area of the arch of aorta which is coming down as a descending aorta so in this region will be your recurrent laryngeal nerve where you have to be very careful during your dissection not to injure it 
So for the anatomy of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, we go back to the anatomy of the vagus nerve. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve will hook around the arch of the aorta and the right recurrent laryngeal nerve will be hooking around the right subclavian vessels. And that's where you're going to be uh, careful about your dissection. So both the nerves go into the, finally go to the tracheoesophageal groove. Uh, I think when we uh, see the usophageal videos, we will be going more into the details of the uh, uh, right recurrent laryngeal nerve nodes. But main, the most important thing is that you do the dissection in the re region of the vagus and then go on to the right subclavian artery and find the right recurrent laryngeal nerve there and take off the nodes. So this is the anatomy in more details. So this is the vagus. When you hook the vagus laterally, you can see the right recurrent nerve going up and hooking up in, uh, below the subclavian artery. Now we come to the left hemithorax. Left hemithorax is dominated by the arch of the aorta. So once you realize where the arch of the aorta is, you can define where the hilum of the lung is going to be there, just below the arch. And what is more important is that the structure be just below the arch of the aorta is the left pulmonary artery. And this is the aortico pulmonary window here. The nerves that you have to note is the phrenic nerve that goes on to the pericardium, the vagus nerve that comes here. And then it gives off the branch here, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which hooks around the arch of aorta and the ligamentum arteriosum that is here. The other structures are common as in the uh, on the right side is the diaphragm, the intercostal spaces, the ribs, the sympathetic chain. And here on this side, you see the subclavian vessels. The, that is the branches of the arch of aorta, subclavian vessel, the left common carotid artery. So now here, when you look at the apex of the lung, near the apex of the thorax, this is the left subclavian artery. You will have the common carotid artery, and then this is going to be the phrenic nerve that goes onto the, the phrenic nerve that is going onto the pericardium. And here is the aortic arch. Again, these are the great vessels coming from the aortic arch. And this is the AP window nodes. And this is the root of the left lung. So just lateral to the phrenic nerve again here. And this is where you will have the pulmonary artery. As you come lower down the phrenic nerve, you come to the lower part of the hilum. Here will be the inferior pulmonary ligament. This is the pericardium, inferior pulmonary ligament. And if you divide that inferior pulmonary ligament, you will come to the inferior pulmonary vein. So you can see the relations here, the, the pulmonary artery here, the superior pulmonary vein and the inferior pulmonary vein. Then we come to the mediastinum. Mediastinum, that is mainly the thymus. So from the left, when you visualize it from the right side, this is the right phrenic. And you can see the uh, you come from the right side to the thymus. Similarly, from the left side, you see the left phrenic nerve and then you come to the thymus. This is the aortic arch, the phrenic nerve going on to the pericardium and then above it the thymus. And in this area above, you see the anterior thoracic wall with the mammary vessels there. And this is the left subclavian artery. So here you should, uh, this is the left brachiocephalic vein where main, the vein that goes there, that is the main one that you're going to take as well as the vessels are quite small here. These are the internal thoracic vessels. We go a little into the lung anatomy now. Uh, this is a revision of your open lung anatomy. Basically, on the right side, you have got three lobes. On the left side, there are two lobes. It has got, there are two fissures on the right side. That is the oblique fissure and the horizontal fissure, which divides it into superior, middle and inferior lobe on the right side. Whereas there is only a, 
an oblique fissure that is the major fissure on the left side which divides it into the superior and the inferior lobe these fissures are quite underdeveloped or uh, undeveloped in some patients and the in that case access to the hilar structures is going to be difficult and it is important to know the anatomy so that you can go on with your lung resections so when you look at the lobes of the uh, lung on the right side the superior lobe consists of the apical posterior and anterior segments the middle lobe consists of the lateral and the medial segments and the inferior lobe consists of the superior or dorsal segment and the four basal segments on the left side this apical and posterior combine to form the apico posterior and the anterior and the superior and the inferior lingula these are the parts of the superior lobe and the uh, inferior lobe consists of the uh, anterior medial basal uh segment plus two basal segments and a superior segment so in to total you have more segments on the right side and less segments on the left side so let's start with some of the anatomical features of the right lung so when you look at the um, hilum of the lung here is the zygus which is your def uh, point of definition and the phrenic nerve which is another point of definition just below the zygus you can see this is the right main bronchus is the superior pulmonary vein uh, uh, the pulmonary artery and in front of it is the superior pulmonary vein and low down when you go from below open the inferior pulmonary ligament you come to the inferior pulmonary vein so when you have to access to the hilum of the lung the basic thing is that you have to go close to the azygous vein and do your dissection when you want to do it posteriorly and anteriorly near the phrenic now the we'll uh, fish... for another 2 minutes okay so i think this all we will be going into the um, we go to the superior pulmonary vein which is just anterior the uh, anterior to the pulmonary artery and it lies into the uh and it lies anterior to the bronchus and then the inferior pulmonary uh, vein is uh, as i have explained before i think this anatomy we will be seeing more in details when we do the uh, lobectomies but uh, what we need to understand is the fissures the div division of the fissures so when you have to go to the uh, right oblique fissure you have to go between the middle pulmonary artery and the basal segment of the lower pulmonary artery and when you are going to the upper fissure you have to go between the recurrent uh, vein that goes to the posterior uh, segment of the upper lobe and the dorsal segment of the lower pulmonary artery and the middle just medial to the middle pulmonary artery will be the horizontal fissure and these are the areas that are going to be important for your dissection so this is how it is going to look when you uh, when you are doing your dissection so you are, here you can see the posterior ascending branch of the upper pulmonary artery these are the dorsal branches uh, 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 this is the dorsal branch of the uh, lower pulmonary artery and these are the basal, basal branches and this is the middle lobe artery uh contents of the ap when we come to the left side now as i have explained the ap window we have to understand the contents are the left recurrent lagnal nerve the left vagus nerve the ligamentum arteriosum and the lymph nodes here i think we don't go into the details of all this uh the left hilum anatomy you see is related to the arch of the aorta you have the pul aortico pulmonary window the left pulmonary artery and the superior pulmonary vein the inferior pulmonary vein will be the near the inferior pulmonary ligament dr patilio time is over yes okay thank you conclusion it is a complex but uh, the thoracoscopic anatomy is complex but its knowledge is essential to perform vat successfully and to avoid complications thank you thank you dr patil we will go into questions later uh, we'll straight away go to the next topic uh, next topic is ot setup and equipment 
uh, this will be by dr ali zamir khan who is from uk he practices in london uh, dr ali zamir khan please come in chairman sir ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this prestigious forum i hope you can see my slides uh, can somebody just confirm that you can see the slides we can see your slide so whenever we talk of thoracic surgery we think about this big cut on the chest wall cutting through muscles spreading the ribs and getting into the chest uh, about 15 uh, you know we have all trained through sternotomies and thoracotomies as cardiothoracic surgeons but about 15 years ago or 16 years ago we started doing the program of minimally invasive chest wall surgery which is video assisted thoracoscopic surgery reducing the cuts to tiny cuts not cutting the muscle just splitting them and certainly not putting in a retractor to spread the ribs and all of this helped to cut down the trauma to the chest wall and helped us to do exactly the same surgery that we were doing with open techniques by using the camera and the keyhole so we started off with three port vats and with time uh, you know different surgeons developed better techniques and we went down to two ports and then nowadays the forte is a single port valves which is also called as uniportal valves um, and of course the progress from there on was on to robotic surgery and then now the uh, uh, new uh, toy in town is the single port robot so really i was asked to talk about the theater setup and discuss how should a general surgeon uh, working in a in a tertiary or a or a you know smaller city how does he start doing vats so if you are lucky enough to be in a big hospital which has got two towers in your theater that's great but most of us would probably have just a single tower and so i'll show you how you set up your theater to perform uh, the video assisted thoracoscopic surgery even in the smallest of centers if you are going to be buying a vats equipment then i would suggest that the vision is very important and you must go for a hd three chip camera a three chip camera happen uh, handles the red uh, rgb red green and blue on three separate chips and so the vision is much more sharper of course uh, technology has moved on and nowadays we are uh, in the world of wireless thoracoscopes and we are using this sort of a small a uh, portable camera which you can put into your bag and take it to the next hospital if you're operating in multiple units uh, also the light source has gone uh, portable so instead of having the whole tower you can have this small led light source which gives you about 50000 hours of uh, light and and the beauty of it is that this camera can wirelessly connect to any screen or can connect to any um, handheld device uh monitors are very important please uh, do not buy an hd camera and use a simple st monitor because the vision is highly dependent on the quality of the monitor so please uh, make sure that you invest in a very good monitor you cannot buy a mercedes and put in cheap tires the monitor should be equally good uh in the old days all of us did laparoscopy with xenon light sources but nowadays the gold standard is an led light source because this is a cool light source xenon is a hot light source and most importantly the electricity usage with this is very low and the bulb lasts you for more than 50000 hours and as i showed you there is also a portable uh, uh, led light source which is available uh, in thoracic surgery the use of co2 is very limited we use co2 only in thymic surgery or in pediatric thoracic surgery the chest wall is rigid and the moment you make your incision and create the pneumothorax actually the lung drops away and the whole surgery can be done without using co2 so in our clinical practice uh, you know we don't use co2 as a routine except for thymic surgery where the co2 dissects ahead of you in the mediastinum and helps you to perform your surgery the important thing that you need to invest is a recording device it's absolutely mandatory the way to learn that is you must record all your operations and you must physically edit these operations in the evenings so that you can learn from your mistakes and you can become a better surgeon next time there are many many personal recording devices available right from a dvd recorder all the way to a hard disk a hd hard disk drive so any one of this is available but the one that we now use is the smart contact lens and the smart contact lens is something that you put it into your eye 
and uh, when you blink your eye automatically the recording starts and when you blink your eye the recording stops so the beauty of this is that this connects directly by wi-fi in the whole theater to a hard disk and the hard disk can be changed you can put in one terabyte almost up to eight terabytes now and so you can store all your uh, recordings it's very very important to record all your operations because that is the real learning in vats uh, there is availability of 3d endoscopes in the market and they do give you a good uh, depth of perception uh, but having used robotics i feel that the 3d and uh, visualization with robotics is far superior to 3d endoscopes but then there are a lot of people who are using 3d endoscopes and it's very good and you can use it if, if you have the availability to do it the next question that comes is where does the surgeon stand where is the assistant where is the monitor so there are two positions in that the moment the patient is lateral the surgeon can be in front of the patient which is called as the anterior approach and actually 98% of the people around the world do their surgeries in vats by standing in front of the patient whether it is the left side or the right side it doesn't matter you stand in front of the patient and access the patient from the front the advantage of the anterior approach is that you get to the hilum straight away and so you are in a better position to control it and the other way old people like me still do it through the posterior approach because we trained in the posterior approach and the advantage of the posterior approach is that the vision is exactly that you get in an open surgery and the second thing is if you ever have a bleed in a posterior approach it takes you literally seconds to get into the chest and control your bleeding so there are pros and cons to either this is how an anterior approach is done you can have two ports you can have three ports and nowadays the fashion is single port most people actually around the world are increasingly doing most of their surgeries by making a single uh, three to five centimeter incision and the camera and instruments go in through the same thing and uh, diego gonzalez rivas has popular, popularized this technique and it has got great advantages for the patient uh, so if you've got two cameras then if you've got two monitors then your assistant goes opposite you stand in front and your scrub nurse comes next to you so you get more maneuverability the problem is when you have a single monitor then all three have to come on the same side but the trolley can go to the opposite side and that sort of gives you some space to maneuver your movements if you are doing this as uniportal then both the surgeon and the assistant are on the same side because there is no space for the uh, uh, assistant to lean over from the opposite side the other approach is a posterior approach again you can have a posterior approach dual screen where the surgeon is on one side the monitor the assistant and the nurse is on the opposite side or you can have a single screen where all three come back on the same side and the monitor goes to the opposite side uh, it completely depends on what is available in your theater uh, the japanese have a technique called as upside down monitor because in vats the vision is a mirror image when you move your hand to the uh, to the right the tip of the instrument moves to the left and when you move your hand to the left the tip of the instrument moves to the right hence your brain takes a little more time to get hand eye coordination so the japanese turn the monitor upside down and so moment you turn the monitor upside down it is actually a true intuitive movement so if you move your hand to the right the tip moves to the right and if you move your hand to the left the tip moves to the left and this but it takes some time for your brain to get used to this sort of technique this upside down monitor technique uh, but you got to sort of learn and do whichever way you do now positioning in vats is very 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 important 98% of surgeries are done with the patient lateral about 2% of surgeries ie thymic surgeries or mediastinal tumors are done with the patient supine and esophagus can be done with prone with pulley velus technique uh, to do prone esophagectomy i personally am going to show you the posterior approach positioning so for me the view should be the same as thoracotomy the ischial tuberosity should be as low as possible so that the camera can move 180 degrees across the chest and not hit the ischial tuberosity and the intercostal spaces should be wide open so that you do not damage the intercostal neurovascular bundle my patient is put lateral always to the edge of the table towards me so that i don't have to lean over and hurt my back i use a table with two breaks i will keep the patient in such a way that the thoracotomy line lies on the first break and the hip lies on the second break and i'll start off first by doing a head low when you do a head low the intercostal spaces start to open up 
But the problem with doing just the head low is that the legs hang down. So the next step is to reverse tendal and bend so that the shoulder comes up, the ischial tuberosity goes down, and then the third movement is a leg up. So once you do a head low, reverse tendal and bend, and leg up, your three positions are achieved. The shoulder is higher than the ischial tuberosity, the intercostal spaces are wide open, and if you stand at the back of the patient, the view is same as you would get with an open thoracotomy. This is my position, this is a patient. And in the UK, I used bean bags to fix the patient to the table. In India, when I operated in smaller centers or in rural cities, I would use this uh, elastoplast to secure the patient to the table. The key thing is that the patient should not move during the operation. If it's a female patient because hips are wide, always put an additional soft bolster to lift up the chest and that puts the uh, hips down so that your camera can move down. Uh, always remember to pad all pressure points because you can get nerve injuries. Uh, so ulnar nerve, median nerve, always take care of all pressure points. Always put a soft padding in the axilla below so that you do not get brachial plexus injuries on the opposite side. Uh, always isolate the lung before you go to scrub your hands because it takes about 15 to 20 minutes for the lung to go down. And if you start making an incision immediately after isolation, chances are you will hurt the lung and injure the lung. And that will cause bleeding and your vision will be upset. Uh, this is a thymectomy position. You can put the hands on the side or you can put it down below or you can put it on the top. I would not advise putting on the top because sometimes the brachial plexus can get pulled and you might end up with injury to the brachial plexus. Is, is, is a worrisome position because if you're not careful, if the hand goes more than 90 degrees, then the brachial plexus will be injured. These are the sort of incisions we make for thymectomies and uh, we'll talk about it. Whenever you do a lobectomy, I do not put any ports in the three centimeters lateral to the vertebral spine because that's a very narrow intercostal space. I draw my thoracotomy line and I draw the tip of the scapula. The tip of the scapula always corresponds with the fifth intercostal space above the sixth rib. And that is the landmark that is used because once you have draped it, it is very difficult to count the ribs. So you always look for the tip of the scapula. And my, I draw a thoracotomy line and I take away the middle of the thoracotomy line. So my anterior incision is here, my posterior incision is here, and my camera incision is tip of the thoracotomy of the, of the scapula a little anteriorly. And this is how I start. I always start with the anterior incision first. I don't go low because I do not want to injure the diaphragm. I will always give preemptive analgesia. I learned this from my general surgery colleagues. And I always aspirate back the lignocaine to make sure that I'm in the correct space. Having done that, I'll make my incision. I usually start with a 10 or an, uh, usually an 11 or a 12 millimeter incision. And this is the most important step. Particularly in India, it is very, very important because the lungs are stuck. And when lungs are stuck, the one thing that you don't want to do is put in a port straight away. So always put in a finger and dissect around the lung before you put in a port. If this is the only point you take away today, I'll be a happy bunny. Because the number of times people have injured lungs by pushing in a sharp trocar is, is unimaginable. And then once you have done that, you can use a you can use a wound retractor to put it away. But when you're operating in a small place, all I do is put four stitches on the four corners, that saves you money and saves you using a wound protector. And the four corners and the four sides keeps the wound open. The moment the wound is open and the pleura is open, a pneumothorax is created and the lung collapses away. So you do not need to use a port, a hard port. The only place where you use a port is where the camera goes in because you want to just protect the, uh, you want to protect the uh, intercostal nerve. So these are the three incisions, one, two, and three. And this is where the camera has gone. The camera always goes in the lowermost position. And then this becomes your right hand, this becomes your left hand. If you're doing this uniportal, then the whole incision will just come here and all instruments and camera will go through the same port. And that is a technique that's been developed now. Um, I do not use CO2. I only use it for thymectomy. And I just use one 11 mm port only for the camera. The beauty of the chest wall is that the uh, rigidity keeps the uh, ports open and you do not need ports because ports can themselves damage the intercostal nerve and you can get post-operative neuralgia. So this is very important. 
Uh, cameras, I would use a 30 degree scope. Always learn with a 30 degree scope. Start with a 10 mm, and if it's a pediatric or a younger kid, then you can use five or three mm. But the worry is that if you bend the camera on the intercostal space, unlike the abdomen here, there are two ribs, then you might damage the camera. So a lot of new people may end up damaging five mm camera. So start with a 10 mm camera, okay? And uh, I, I use a 30 degrees all the times. From the word go, learn 30 degrees and your head and eye coordination will become 30 degrees. Endochameleon is great, but it is very difficult in the chest because the moment somebody turns it uh, very quickly, it goes from 30 to 120 degrees and you don't realize it. Why the hell your hand eye coordination has gone off? So only very, very experienced people should use endochameleon. Endochameleon works well also in uniportal surgery where you don't have too much maneuverability of the camera. But in a standard operation, 30 degrees is good enough. Instruments, I would not advise you to use laparoscopic instruments because the abdomen is different as compared to the chest. This right angle bend is not good for the chest or for your neck or for your back. We've done studies on this and we found that when you're operating on the chest, you need straight instruments. You do not need that right angle uh, bend. And we use just the open thoracotomy set, albeit we have some long instruments in this. So my standard instrument for a lobectomy would be a peanut dissector on an 18-inch uh, Roberts. I would use a swab on a stick. Very important. This actually saves lives because when you bleed, all you have to do is push the swab on a stick and put pressure. So this should always be there. And then we have these cheap instruments made in the Indian. We have got these made in a local uh, workshop and we make these available for very, very cheap. These are dual uh, hinge. There are two hinges. So this lies in the chest wall and it opens up in the front and the back opens up. So you do not damage the intercostal nerve. So these are available. If you buy a Scanlon set, each instrument is about 1.5 lakhs. But the whole set of 10 instruments with this sort of thing, you can buy for 50 to 60,000. So there are a lot of these new instruments which we developed specific, specifically for the Indian market to help young surgeons in smaller cities to do uh, bad surgery. Do not forget, always put specimens into bags because if you do not put specimens into bags, you will end up with port side metastases. Very, very bad thing to happen to the patient. So do not, uh, you know, you can use simple bags. This is just a urinary bag with a purse string on it. And in India, it is pretty cheap to do that. And you can just get the specimen out. Uh, single drain in the chest and next morning, the drain is removed if there is no air leak. The fluid that comes out is not a worry. We are not worried about the amount of fluid that comes out. We even take out a three, 400 ml. It's not an issue. The important thing is you must, anything that you do by VATS, you must know how to do by open surgery. Please do not attempt to do VATS, what you cannot do open, because when things go wrong, the patient's life is saved only by open surgery. And so very, very, very important. There are four stages to learning VATS. The first one is, you put in your drain site at the start of your thoracotomy. Put the thoracotomy and put the drain site. Put in a VATS camera and most of the time look down and operate. And for five or ten minutes, look up at the camera and operate. And the second advantage is the uh, VATS camera brings the light with it. So the vision in an open case becomes much better. Then you make it into a smaller mini thoracotomy. Start doing some basic VATS procedures and then learn to do advanced VATS procedures. Conversion uh, is I never a failure of VATS. This is my last slide. Thank you very much. Conversion is never a failure of VATS. If you're ever worried, please convert. Please convert because the bottom line is you need a live patient. So please do not be a hero. Just convert to open the record. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Ali. It's an excellent talk, amazing talk. Uh, just one question from my side. The e mirror image you talked about, can yes. you explain that? Uh, why is it a mirror image? When you were, yeah, uh, because the way the optics are set up in a VATS, um, there are, there are uh, the optical system within a VATS happens in such a way that when you operate in a chest, the fulcrum of movement is the intercostal space. That's one. And when you move your hand down, the tip of the instrument moves up. That is the normal optics of a VATS camera. In robotics, it's completely opposite. 
Robotics, if you move your hand down, the tip of the instrument moves down. It is already inbuilt into the system to give you a true image. Whereas in VATS, it is always a mirror image. It, it, it's the optic. If you look at a camera, a digital camera, actually, when you edit a digital photo onto a software, you will realize that it is what is right is left and what is left is right. And that is the way the optics are set up. That is the, it's a principle of physics that is used in VATS. Whereas robotics uses a different principle where the image is inverted. And so you get a more intuitive movement with robotics. And so your brain takes a lot of time to get used to it. Uh, that is why it's difficult to learn that. And it's the same with laparoscopy as well, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we move on to the next uh, topic. Uh, this is anesthesia and positioning for the surgeon and atrodigenic injury uh, management. This will be taken by Dr. Jignesh Gandhi, who is from Mumbai. Uh, Jignesh, over to you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. So, excellent talk by my previous two speakers. And uh, the reason I chose up this topic was as I'll go through the slides and let you know, I am a GI laparoscopy and a robotic surgeon, but I have a keen interest in doing a lot of non-lung thoracic work at our setup. I have no conflicts of interest. But let me tell you at the outset that I'm not an anesthetist, but I am a husband to a very pretty anesthetist. And that's where I think probably some of my talk messages would come from. So why surgeon and thoracoscopy? Thoracoscopy cases are always very challenging. And sharing is caring. This is one area where you share the airway with the anesthetist and the thoracoscopy cases. So it is very, very crucial. Dr. Ali earlier mentioned that the moment he puts in his ports, the lung is down. But let me tell you the reality that when you start off with the program, uh, your anesthetists are also not very keen and even the surgeons are not very uh, clear with what they need to understand about. There are challenges because there is lack of universal training in thoracoscopy. Uh, Professor Dr. Raman Goyal was just discussing about that earlier when we started off with the meeting. The lung compliance is variable because in India and also I would I suggest same abroad that you have a lot of patients who will be smoker, there'll be early fibrosis. Tuberculosis is our main disease uh, in India. So we come across a lot of cases where we don't expect anything and the moment we go in, it's absolutely a frozen lung. And help and compliment from the anesthesia colleagues. So I think it's a teamwork where you and your anesthetists, you work together. And that's where I was stimulated to learn more and more about you know the single lung anesthesia as we're going to talk today. And the position of the patient can always change the position of the tube. And I think it is so crucial. Sometimes it has happened that we have placed the left tube into the main bronchus and then the position is changed and suddenly everything changes there because it has not been fixed properly. There is some technical issues and that's where we face a lot of problems. So if you see for the surgeons to understand how it works, by and large, uh, it is always preferred that the surgeon or the anesthetist prefer the left-sided double lumen tube. The reason I will cite that uh, later, because the thing is that most of the times we, when you put in a left-sided uh, double lumen tube, you have a good control on the right and the left lung both. But when you put in on a right-sided tube, you need this additional opening, which I will show you now. So this is how it is. The left-sided double lumen tube is always preferred and it is a blue connection, which you can see here. So the blue is for bronchus, so it just goes into the left side. The right side, it just stops short here and then it will ventilate the right lung. Uh, that is how you make out on the table. So this is how a left-sided double lumen tube is actually placed when it is inside in the right position. But sometimes what happens is by mistake, you know, the patient moves and this tube flips from this side onto the right side. Now, the problem with this, what occurs is that you are doing a right-sided surgery. You have, you know, worked on to collapse into the right side. But now suddenly your right-sided, you know, the tube has flipped up on this side. This part of the lung doesn't get ventilated properly and then there are issues and this can lead into a lot of chaos. So it's always better that the surgeon, if you're starting a thoracoscopy work, start with a left-sided double lumen tube, discuss this with your anesthesia colleagues so that you are better and safe. So this is the area which gets not ventilated if you're using it on the left side and it extremely turns around. So there is a difference between the left and the right side. So how do you identify? The right side always will have an additional opening here and you saw earlier that opening is because the right apical lobe needs a good amount of ventilation. So this is how a surgeon should know that what kind of tube is used because you need to assist and help your anesthetist all the time when you're doing these kind of cases. So this is how it works. So this is the left-sided double lumen tube put into the uh, uh, patient. 
Now, it's very important that when you're collapsing the right lung, if you want to do a right lung surgery, you have to apply the clamp here. A lot of times, you know, what happens is that people don't understand when even the anesthetist is new, they wear to clamp and accidentally they put in a clamp here, but they forget that when you put a clamp here, this vent from where the air is going to come out and collapse your right lung gets affected. So always remember the clamp has to be put more uh, proximally from where it is coming from the ventilator side and not here because that can affect your lung collapse. And if your lung collapse is not right, you will be struggling inside. So the right lung collapse is only possible when you clamp it more proximally at this level here. This is what is done, which is not the right way to do it. This is absolutely wrong. So uh, blocking the venting also happens here because of the wrong technique. And then you will not get an adequate collapse when you want it. Additional collapse, uh, because sometimes it does happen, as I told you, that when you're starting off with thoracoscopy, you do not get the right amount of collapse which you want. So you need an additional collapse. What you should do is we apply a suction here. So this is something which I shared with my anesthetist when we were starting off with thoracoscopy cases. And they really appreciated that. And they were very happy that uh, you know I could help them out because I had read about it earlier. So you can put in a suction here, which would be a low-pressure suction. And suddenly, you will find that your right lung completely collapses. And then you get a very nice, comfortable feel. Patient positioning, this has been put in a lot of times. Now, what happens is for a surgeon like me who is graduating from a GI surgery to a thoracoscopic surgery, I have an abdominal cavity. I can put in 5 liters of carbon dioxide. The moment I put 5 liters of carbon dioxide, I get a nice distension. So I get the whole thing to play. But what happens in thorax? It is as rigid as the rock. In the thoracic cavity, even if I'm going to put 10 liters of CO2 or absolutely nothing, I'm just going to get the same thing. So what happens in thoracoscopic surgery is the surgeon actually works around changing the position of the patient to his advantage. So this is one surgery where it's going to be so important that since you have a rigid cavity, changing the position is what is going to help you. So as you can see here, for a thoracoscopic thymectomy, this would be how I'll be putting my port position. The idea is to put the arms, everything aside. Each surgeon has his own positioning because he would like to put it according to his ergonomics. This is for the resection of the lung. Now, mind you, it is very, very important to strap the lungs, break the table. So the surgeon himself, before he does his first case, he has to look into all these aspects because if you do not know the maneuverability of your table, you can sometimes land up into a lot of problems. For thoracic sympathectomy, you have to always make the patient sit up like this. So these are small little things. So when I, when I uh, tell my team that this is what we are going to do, we discuss right from the positioning of the patient. It's very important that each member in the team, right from the anesthetist to your first and second assistant, knows exactly what you're going to do. Your OT technicians need to understand what position you're going to give because together only you can do a good teamwork. Or, or if you are going to do a surgery here where you need a closed axilla versus an open axilla. So a simple lithotomy attachment like this. Sometimes people tell me I do not have a complicated, a big hi-fi table. I just tell them that you put up a lithotomy attachment here. It will open up your axilla and it will make your life so easy. So sometimes in Indian scenario, we have to do this Indian jugad, what we call, try to find out the gadgets from our own table and try to get our own positioning properly. Or for a prone position. Uh, as Dr. Palani Velu has mentioned, I do all my esophagus through the prone position. Some people do it through a lateral, uh, semilateral position. This is how you can achieve. Getting the patient at the edge of the table is very, very crucial because most of the time you don't want your hand banging against that area and giving you the trouble. So you can see here in this one of these pictures, look how the patient has been draped and fixed up so well because you have to sometimes still the patient almost to this angle. And you need to look today in the era of medical legal, we need to look at all these cushioning points because we do not want the patient to have any diathermy uh, related injuries or any injuries related to any pressure source. Uh, so this all things are very, very crucial before you actually start your thoracoscopic surgeries. So let me now come to my case. This was a young lady who had symptoms of GERD and hyperacidity. She had gone to a center where she underwent an upper GI scopy with a local spray. Still in India, we have a lot of cases where we do it under topical spray. And look what happened. I think it was probably the learning curve for the person who was doing the endoscopy. She had a very uncomfortable experience at the end of the scopy. And she had severe neck pain after the procedure. This is what she told me when she came to our setup. And she was discharged to home after the endoscopy. But after going home, she started developing fever and pain during the swallowing. So when she came into us and the visit our place, we saw in clinical examination, she had a lot of neck tenderness on the right side. We did a CT scan which showed a collection on the right lower neck region, tracking down into the chest with some air pockets. 
So we probably felt that there's some kind of a micro perforation happened there because of the struggle while putting in the scope, patient not swallowing properly, and there could be a forceful entry in that area which must have caused it. She had a very high white cell count and she had a septic look. The diagnosis was made of approximately esophageal perforation, and I had I was called in to plan for a thoracoscopy because partly the abscess was in the neck and the remaining part of it was going into the chest. So. <clears throat> So this was a patient positioning which we had planned in that case. We had given it a prone position because for the right-sided procedures, I always give a prone position. I'm very, very comfortable. Now our anesthesia team is used to using the left-sided double lumen tube, as I showed you earlier. We collapse the right lung very, very well. So putting in the three ports, as rightly mentioned by all the previous speakers, taking all the precautions, then you go in. And now with more and more cases, we get a good lung collapse and very, very comfortably. So if you see this, this is a video. Uh, in perforation of the cervical esophagus, there are conservative approach. But when you have a large amount of collection there, straight away you have to go for a thoracoscopic surgery. So this is the area where the patient had a probable perforation. And because of this, we planned that we should go ahead with a prone position and then put in our ports. So typically I had using the three-port technique with the triangulation in the fifth, seventh, and the ninth space. The moment I entered inside, I could see some adhesions as you can see here. And there are some pus flakes which are seen in the apex on the right side. So there are these few adhesions which are taken down with a combination of harmonic. Since uh, these were our initial ventures while doing this, so we thought that harmonic is a good tool. So you can do that. And uh, slowly the lung is taken out of the field. She had one more adhesion here. So as I told you, in India, one needs to be very, very careful about tuberculosis because sometimes the past history of tuberculosis with the child can leave ahead some amount of fibrosis and you can have trouble. Slowly then the lung is taken off. And being a GI surgeon, I use this liver retractor and I push this lung gently down, it really adds to me uh, having that advantage. So a lot of times, you know, the experience of your GI surgery helps you there. You can see that boginess over that in that area. Then we went in and then I opened up in that area where I could see, and you can see nice flow of pus, which is coming in from that area. The part of the sample was collected for culture. Uh, and then you can see the suction is put into that. You open up the pleura there and now you can see the pus flakes. So you identify that area very, very comfortably. Once you have done that, you go ahead and widen that opening because you need a good drainage. It is a principle of any abscess anywhere in the body that it has to have a good wide drainage. So what was done was we went in subsequently, sucked out all that area. You can see the pus flakes there. Mind you, sometimes if the patients have a very small perforation somewhere, it is very difficult because you saw this patient manifested almost after three, four days. But look at the view with the 30 degree and because we are used to doing a lot of fundo applications, my assistants uh, are very comfortable in showing me that space up into the neck. So you can go ahead. I removed that part of the pleura because I wanted a free and open drainage. And then I gave it a beaded in wash, as you can see in here, cleaned up the cavity completely. So remove all the pus flakes in that area. And then put in an ICD drain in that uh, place. A 28 inch drain is placed in that area. It's very difficult, I can tell you, to identify that pinpoint perforation. But if you have given a good lavage, and then you, this patient was put on a nasogenal tube at the time of surgery, and then we desufflate the lung after a good wash under vision. So you can see that the lung has been deflated gradually, and then you achieve that. And with this, what happens is that that area gets sealed off. This lady on the post-operative course, the thoracic drain was kept for one week. She had a good lung expansion of the chest x-ray subsequently. She responded very well to the broad spectrum antibiotics and sent home on day seven with the removal of the drain. And her primary issues of GERD when they later managed with the medical management. Uh, I thank you all uh, for your attention. And uh, I'm always available on my YouTube or my email or on WhatsApp for any consultation anytime, for any work or any advice. And we can always discuss as a team about any case thoracoscopically. I thank you all for your kind attention and I'll be happy to answer the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Jignesh, uh, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, it was very uh, uh, te good teaching lecture. It's very good. It's excellent. Uh, we'll take up questions. Whatever questions, sir, please, uh, I would ask everybody to put it in the chat box, which can be answered by Dr. Jashi Tutkar and yourself later. Uh, Jashi, are you there? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, yes, I am here. Ah, please take over. Good, good evening to everybody. I'm so sorry for uh, some problems in the network. Uh, very well done, the all three faculties in the beginning. Uh, we go to the next session, that is Get Started. The first lecture will be by Dr. Narendra Agarwal. 
diagnostic thoracoscopy, and he will cover unexplained diffusions, lymphadenopathies, fever, biopsy techniques, and many other things. Over to Dr. Agarwal. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. With an excellent uh, session, first session, which uh, enlightened us on the major topic of uh, how to set up thoracoscopic program, along with uh, how to uh, go ahead with an SCCR positioning instrumentation. So uh, my case presentation or my uh, presentation would be much easier for everybody to understand because it has covered 50% of what my presentation meant. So I mean, I'll start with the very basic uh, presentation of diagnostic thoracoscopy. This uh, is a target population or uh, patient uh, with you, uh, I mean, the, all the uh, doctors who have just started thoracoscopy with a good knowledge of uh, intervention in thoracic and they love to do thoracotomies and they want to go ahead with a thoracoscopic program. So what is diagnostic thoracoscopy? I hope I am, uh, can we go on the next slide? Yeah, so uh, exploration of the uh, thoracic cavity for diagnostic purpose uh, using thoracoscope is thoracoscopy. And why do we uh, do have this? This purely thoracoscopy, why we have a diagnostic word, so we only include in the diagnostic indications. And when these cases are including when biochemistry uh, patients referred for biochemistry, cytology, bacteriology, and they all turn out to be negative or they are not a good diagnosis with the needle biopsy of the pura. So the diagnostic efficacy in this, these cases is more than 90% in the recurrent in an explained effusion. In the cases of thickened pleura, lung parenchyma and nodules, staging and biopsy of metastatal lymph nodes, and staging procedures also helps in determination of disease and many other possible prognosis in lung cancer and management of mesothelioma. So these patients are generally referred from all the specialties like pulmonology, inter, uh, internal medicine, critical care, oncology, immunology, and nephrology. So it's very important for us to, as general surgeons, to develop our skills in thoracoscopy and the basic case we should pick up so that we get maximum reference and our scope of practice uh, as a general surgeon who is uh, venturing into thoracoscopy increases. And we can actually have a lot of references and win so what symptoms uh, these patients are referred to you? Mostly uh, patients are generally asymptomatic, but they uh, come with uh, certain patients are coming up with the uh, pleural inflammation causing unexplained fever, uh, dyspnea and non-productive curve and chest pain, which is due to pleura. So before we take on to thoracoscopy, what maximum things we need to do to proceed with this thoracoscopy program? So we have to understand for all the reasons that we, why we are going to do the thoracoscopy, what we have to going to achieve in the thoracoscopy. So to understand, we have to have a good preoperative imaging studies. And we need to discuss with our radiologist friends or colleagues before we take on any case that what is the importance of radiological imaging in our case to proceed. So, and secondly, anesthesia. So what case, how the patient is going to be comfortable if certain patients are there in the thoracoscopy where in diagnostic cases who are not fit for anesthesia. So what alternative we can have? So we call it medical thoracoscopy by, done by the medical professionals, but actually it, can, uh, it is not so easy where we, when we conclude that medical thoracoscopy can be done by pulmonologist. So we have to understand the uh, difficulties in that also. So, and the position. Again, position has been very well discussed by Dr. Khan, so I would be taking it in a very short way. Port placements and instruments. So I, whatever is being discussed is in reference how a, a new general surgeon or a general surgeon who has started his practice in thoracoscopy takes over. So understanding radiological imaging is very important again. So in, in the slide one, way which we are seeing a CT scan, we have to understand every CT scan, whether there is an effusion, whether there is a pleural thickening. There is a very different, I mean, once you made a mistake of getting into a case inside without thinking what is, there is an effusion or there is a thickening. So you may make, make a big blunder when you enter inside. So planning it out, whether it is an effusion or whether it is a, a, a pleural thickening, you can actually so, uh, solve the problems which you can venture during the beginning of the, your career in your uh, thoracoscope. 
so and in cases of you have, you have any references from oncology team or uh, you as a uh, as a onco surgeon if you have any cases like this and you have to take a biopsy again you have a pet scan imaging which helps you to understand where, where, where which site you have to take a biopsy so pet scan is again very important in the cases of thorax where you are trying to deal with any uh, ruling out malignancies so ruling out malignancies you help uh, it helps you to stage the disease also and it you rule out it whether it is a metastatic lesion or not so there that, that lies a very important role of imaging so anesthesia as uh, discussed by previous uh, speakers which they again explained very well about the double lumen uh, single lung ventilation so they explained how how ventilation helps and what can go wrong during ventilations and uh, during anesthesia so at the same time the the anesthesia remains the same but what changes is if the patient is not fit what we can do if general anesthesia in these cases uh, patients are not possible so there are few other points where we can go at the local uh, local anesthesia where we can inject at the site of port insertion and the other options are regional where we go for epidural high epidural where the patient is awake and we can go a certain sedation so these patients are still awake and we can uh, perform a general thoracoscopic uh, diagnostic thoracoscopy because since uh, diagnostic thoracoscopy goes a uh, simpler procedure we can actually start with this even in the patient is awake so we have to we have a very good contribution from anesthetist in our cases so position again as explained by dr khan i also uh, prefer having a lateral decubitus position i prefer because uh, if we need any time of the conversion we can always convert this patient in uh, to thoracotomy at any time and uh, once we are trained for thoracotomy so we know how the position and what uh, uh, organs are going to come at what position so the uh, anatomy is very important to understand in one positions at the same time so and the flexion of the ta operating table which helps in the uh, widen the intercostal door we don't injure the nerve while entering inside and since it is again for the target population so okay so approach as explained we have two approaches anterior and posterior approach so what we choose is anterior approach or posterior approach it depends upon the training or which a surgeon uh, prefers to do i don't have a preferential that you should approach anterior or uh, posterior approach again there were there were points where 98% people have started doing with the uh, anterior approach and 2% are using posterior approach so i don't uh, really go with that fact i am trained to do both the anterior and posterior approach and uh, i always prefer any surgeon prefers can choose their approaches and when uh, so port placements again i have uh, what we have decided that we always kept kept a common uh, port placement uh, for every cases so that we don't have difficulty in uh, making uh, earlier in the when uh, you start your earlier career you don't have uh, where we have to place port so we always choose to have an anterior mid axillary line four to seventh intercostal space uh, one uh, one anterior port first thing which we go inside and uh, that's a fourth uh, four to fifth we choose and uh, looking at the imaging also we decide whether we, it is a good position to go inside or not or we can always choose a seventh intercostal space and if we if we find that the, that is a better space so uh, we have to always make the uh, incision at the at the parallel of the intercostal spaces and uh, using a hemostat or artery forceps we go dissecting the muscles we don't pierce it inside so that if the lung is adhered we just don't go inside with the force and that can cause just what we are not planning to do you will get uh, end up in uh, causing a hemothorax or probably converting a case which was a very easy case for a beginner becomes a difficult case to open for a cotton so when we have come to instruments yes uh, that's true that we uh, we uh, in thoracic uh, we are using a more uh, curved force uh, instruments and we are rightly using the scanlen and other sets of instruments but in cases where you have just started your practice and you don't want to enter too many instruments or uh, you are using uh, instruments of which are you are you are more acute with using a laparoscopic instruments you you can use a grasper you can use maryland and a uh, 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 right angle uh, art, uh, pottery so these and the thoracoscope thoracoscope which i would also prefer 30 degree because it's much easier to go deep inside to look at the deeper cavity and if you look at 0 degree you might just hit the wall 
and you might not be so clear what you are looking at and you might not be able to understand but 30 degree then the, your camera assistant uh, or a person who should be very very well trained where he wants to show you and where you are looking at so diagnostic exploration of the uh, cavity i don't think so would be take up because everybody has explained this so very well dr anjali has explained the anatomy so still i will take on the right lung apex where the most important thing to understand generally in diagnostic uh, thoracoscopy you would not see such a clean anatomy because there is so many additions and you just enter it's a very difficult way but still what what we have to look upon what vessels are there at the right lung apex and where we have to target what uh, so this is not the area where we actually take biopsies especially pleura this is the area where very grievous injuries can happen and the more of vessels are there so we avoid using anterior and apical region for any biopsies the posterior right side posterior aspect is a good point where we are we can see the prominent ribs this is a good area where we can target our pleural biopsies so left lung apex also we have the same thing that we have a, a subclavian and arch of aorta so we should avoid doing biopsies at this region we should not uh, venture into this points uh, at the beginning we just try to use uh, easy procedures easy way so this is left lung anterior region so again left lung posterior you have a much better vision and we can actually do and you can retract lung on the anterior side and the posterior you can have a good vision and when you are uh, your camera is targeting the pathology you can actually go have a good biopsy so biopsy forceps is very important where you are uh, targeting this so what's a type of pathologies you see in the pleura so generally most common cases in our country is tubercular nevertheless we have to always think that every case which comes as a pleural effusion we always take it as a tubercular but it is not like that so there are malignant pleural effusions there are uh, mesothelioma there are benign recurrent pleural effusions and other systemic diseases so how does a tubercular pathology uh, looks like when you go inside and you i mean it's just a, uh, a just a way to understand it and you probably the number of cases you do and the number of diagnostics you do you will come to know what exactly the pathology looks like so grayish white granulomas uh, parietal diaphragmatic uh, is looks like more of a tubercular they at least you should perform different at different sites different pleural biopsy specimen so that you don't miss out something you are uh, two uh, two different pathologies you are not dealing with different paths so at the same time what we have to do is gene expert culture and uh, histopathology of the specimen so malignant pathology always involves visceral pleura also so pleural fluid is uh, is cytology is positive in 60 to 70 cases and uh, gives a marginal benefit on this so in uh, diagnostic uh, thoracoscopy it is much uh, higher yield when we do a biopsy for these malignant pleural effusions and in case if if you have done a frozen section and if, if you might need you can do a pleurodesis at the same setting so this is a, a finding of a mesothelioma where you look upon there is a lot of uh, thick uh, pleural nodules pleural hyperemia and edema pleural plaques so how do we do a pleural biopsy is most uh, pathologies we choose posterior costal uh, pleura safest is a parietal pleura and over the rib it's easier to understand that you're not uh, there would be no vessels and unsafe at the uh, what i told you earlier also apex and uh, anterior parietal pleura so when we talk about lymphadenopathy lymphadenopathy it's it's not so easy to just go on and venture inside the lymph node biopsies but definitely if you have, we have to if we are not doing a lobectomy and we have gone into a diagnostic thoracoscopic work so we have to choose a point where uh, after looking at the images where we can choose to do a biopsy of the mediastinal lymph nodes so when when again in the same image where if you are looking upon this uh, image uh, four and this in a particular point you can always look upon the triangle where it is surrounded by svc azygous and uh, arch of azygous so in this area you will find station 4 which is uh, just lateral to the trachea and esophagus so this area you can actually have a 4r and you can have if you have if a patient has lymphadenopathy or unexplained lymph nodes enlargement 
so you can have a good biopsy from here but this is this is on a clean case where i am showing you the anatomy it's not so easy over there when you go inside you have to have lot of additions and dissections at the apex and you have to take care of that you can easily delineate the anatomy in this area so post operatively you have to always connect thoracic cavity with the intercostal drainage we should never avoid even if you have done a very good case we think that we have to connect this way. secondly because you have a pleural effusion you have to drain the effusion you can uh, always keep the tube until the lung expands completely without any alix and as explained that we don't need to worry about uh, effusion if there is 100 ml or 200 ml but yeah alix as it has to be monitored and adequate analgesia is very important for the patient to recover in the post operative which helps the patient to do uh, avoid atelectasis and do a good in center spirometry this is a very basic to uh, any any thoracic patient you have to uh, target two things uh, in post operative a good surgery does not mean just a good operative time or a good time to recover a patient patient when goes home with no pain and a patient's recovery is completely without any complication there you call it a good uh, uh, surgery so we have to target on a good chest physiotherapy and in center spirometry when patient is com completely ambulated on the day 1 or day 2 so complications again as uh, the beginning of any any thoracic work we have to understand the, the sub most important part is the port uh, access and the maximum injuries are taking place in the trocar uh, injury is when we use any wrong trocar we should not be using a sharp trocar and understanding the imaging and going very slow and with using a small uh, i mean a hemostat using a very slow dissection and going in a very very uh, controlled way inside the pleura so once we reach the pleura we have to be very sure we can put a finger and if there is any additions we can always break that additions rather than just going blindly and just thinking that because it's not like abdomen abdomen you have created a pneumothorax a pneumo a pneumo abdomen and you can actually you, uh, you can easily go inside that and uh, you can easily get inside the port no so but there are also injuries in the uh, abdomen also but there that's a vessel injuries so uh, bleeding due to lung laceration so handling of the lungs is very important during the diagnostic thoracoscopy because there are lot of additions we might just uh, not realize but we when we are we might because a lot of additions we might not be able to understand where the where lung is adhered and then we might just tear off the so that that can be uh, quite profusely so we have to be very gentle with the lung and handle the lung very softly and uh, gently so that we don't have a lung tear anywhere inside anyways uh, due to lung laceration there can be air leak which can lead a prolonged bleeding to prolonged intercostal drainage so we should not be in a hurry even if there is a air leak we should not be in a hurry to uh, remove the tube and discharge a patient rather than uh, you can discharge the patient along with the intercostal tube if there is a mild uh, air leak that is not a problem but the other way you should not do that you just want to remove the tube and uh, send off the patient no so and the other which complication which i have done on myself that's why i am writing this diaphragmatic tear so when i was doing a diagnostic thoracoscopy i didn't realize the, the lower lobe of the lung was completely adhered to the diaphragm and uh, that's very important where you have to delineate yourself where diaphragm and where uh, the lower lobe is so that's the point where i made a mistake and i had uh, uh, i made a tear in the diaphragm so if there is a small tear you can always leave it a very small tear but if there is a big tear you have to if you're not competent enough to take a you can call another surgeon or if you think you can do it then you can open it and do the repair the repair is important so contrary when i have discussed about the indications then very uh, besides anesthetic uh, contraindications we have to understand at the big as a beginner lack of pleural space due to extensive additions and previous pleurodesis or surgery can be a contraindication to diagnostic thoracoscopy and severe coagulopathy we should avoid doing all these kind of diagnostic work so as a surgeon i would suggest understanding the pre operative imaging well choice of anesthesia adequate specimen for diagnostics when in doubt do frozen section and never worry if you have to convert it open to give a diagnostics i have a video which will follow because i haven't uh, put in this but i will have a video can we have a video there is a small video of 3 minutes
so uh, again i have not mentioned about that uh, it's single port or three port or two port it doesn't matter it depend it, it, all these ports depend upon how skilled you become with time so i i don't say that you are doing three port two port single port whatever your choice whatever your comfort what you have to give result and you have to give result to the the team so the management of the patient can happen so what we see is here we have gone inside we see there is a stock alert present we have we, the, the way we are doing is uh, as a base of the this is base we can see the diaphragm again the diaphragm is adhered to the lower lobe so we can see all the additions so we should not be very excited to break the additions we don't need to break the additions we have we are here to only do a diagnostic work so what we have done i have done a, they, we have used a hemostat and we have used a thoracoscopic biopsy forceps so same can be used as a thorac uh, laparoscopic instruments also so in the beginning if you don't have those, those kind of instruments you can always choose to do with the laparoscopic instruments so it was a very simple procedure with just uh, one single port we done it but to begin with you will feel very happy when you finish this and when your physicians or when your colleagues say the diagnostics are uh, diagnosis of the disease has been made and the treatment started that will just give you 100% satisfaction whatever you have done so no surgery is easy and at the same time when you compare the all the thoracic procedures which are going to be discussed in later on the session you would realize this was one of the easiest procedures so what we have connected in the same because it is a single port and we have done from the anterior connected to the chest tube that's it thank you so thank you very much uh, dr narendra agarwal that was now we move to the next speaker dr vishwas dr vishwas is going to talk about thoracoscopic sympathetic tummy are you there sir hello hello i can't see him dr jashi hello i can't see him logged in jay dr jashi yeah i am also not able to see him please move on to the next topic so uh -huh. maybe we we'll move to the next topic dr amol bhanushali are you here yes amol yes, yes madam good evening ha huh, amol good evening uh, so we we'll move to the next topic that is yours okay we are starting with the session 3 thoracoscopic video lectures about the lung so our first speaker in this session is going to be dr amol bhanushali he is going to talk about acute and chronic empyema the management thoracoscopic management so over to dr bhanushali a uh, very good evening uh, at the outset i would like to thank uh, dr jayashree thodkar dr raman goel and team iigs for giving me this opportunity and inviting me for, uh, for this talk uh, so empyema as we all know has a triphasic etiology uh, the options for treatment are uh, drainage uh, by intercostal uh, drainage i mean uh, catheter based treatments like fibrinolytics and then surgical which is vats or open when considering what treatment to choose uh, you have to consider the efficacy of the treatment uh, that is the treatment needs to be definitive and also consider hospital stay morbidity and mortality as well first treatment choice for pleural empyema is a critical determinant of ultimate therapeutic success why do i say this is because it frequently shows fast progression to chronicity 
this was a landmark article in 2007 by molnar which uh, uh, told us about phases of uh, empyema and uh, uh, these are the the various treatment options for the various stages of empyema and this is what we are going to restrict to in this talk uh, that is vats and uh, decortication so when it when you talk about vats decortication what are the points that we have to consider especially as a general surgeon when you are venturing into a, a vats for an empyema uh, and uh, you you have done uh, open decortications when you are going to start doing vats uh, you start thinking about such things like does it take too long is it too difficult Uh, will i be able to achieve uh, complete uh, evacuation of the empyema cavity uh, will i be able to achieve good like lung expansion uh, will i will i end up causing too many lung lacerations will i end up with an air leak uh, when would i will, would i want to convert to a thoracotomy will i require a thoracotomy or right in the beginning or or maybe not and what complications or what morbidity can i cause to the patient so let's try and answer these uh, questions or let's try and think about this uh, in the in the further slides uh, there are enough uh, articles in literature uh, talking about vats versus open thoracotomy and uh, most of them have shown vats to be better than open so much so that now there is a recent article on uniportal thoracoscopic decortication as well so uh, there is enough literature showing uh, vats is the way forward as far as pre op walk up goes uh, cct thorax is mandatory uh, prior to taking up any patient for a, a decortication routine pre op investigations evaluation of cardio respiratory reserve more important in these patients uh, especially in the tuberculous ones is nutritional assessment and build up uh, most of them are uh, nutritionally quite poor uh, pulmonary rehabilitation prior to uh, surgery uh, starting them up on breathing exercises and uh, Just physiotherapy even before the surgery, and uh, adequate anti-tuberculous treatment according to a documented drug sensitivity test is mandatory prior to uh, taking up these patients for surgery. Uh, so the WHO guidelines say at least two months of uh, ATT, six weeks to two months of ATT for primary TB, and four to six months for uh, drug-resistant TB. So that's that's uh, an ideal thing to do prior to taking them up. so uh, this is imaging for empyema this is a typical x ray and then a ct scan of uh, the empyema so few things to point out here uh, are you have to assess few things one is the size of the hemithorax so you can see here that the hemithorax is contracted as compared to the other side secondly the thickness of the pleura so this is the parietal pleura and this is the visceral pleura so uh, assess the thickness of the pleura assess the the site of the uh, empyema so here you can see that uh, most of the lungs uh, parenchymal surface is covered by empyema fluid so here uh, you're still okay but sometimes there is uh, a loculated empyema only on one aspect of the lung so uh, when you when you see my video you will know why i am talking about this that uh, your first port entry into this empyema cavity is important uh, so that you try and not injure the lung uh this is a slightly more uh, chronic empyema larger cavity uh, with a further collapsed lung so this is how, how it looks uh this is a a, a fibrothorax or a calcified pleura uh, what you can call and this is probably the last stage where um, more often than not you would leave alone these patients unless uh, this particular patient had developed a sinus draining out of this cavity that is why to op on her of course it it ended up in a but otherwise usually these kind of calcified pleuras you would not uh, really want to operate on uh, patient positioning has been discussed earlier lateral decubitus flex the table and the thoracotomy line uh, port placement uh, similar to what dr khan described uh, three ports at the anterior and posterior end of the thoracotomy line and the inferior camera ports so this is standard port positioning you may have to change this uh, or depending upon the site of the empyema cavity but uh, most of the times you will be able to deal with uh, all empyemas with this with the standard port positioning only thing is which port to enter through will be the crux of uh, uh, getting into the chest so you will see that in the videos 
so coming to a few videos this is the uh, initial phase stage the fibrinol purulent stage uh, more of loculated effusion than an empyema you can also call it and uh, when you get into the chest uh, you, you see these kind of fibrinous adhesions with uh, fluid uh, interspersed within the loculations so uh, first job is to uh, take out all the fluid and then take out all these fibrinous adhesions you can use uh, various kind of instruments uh, you saw me using a laparoscopic grasper uh, since i use one 5 mm port uh, you you can use a, lap, a combination of laparoscopic and open surgery instruments you can use uh, only open instruments whatever you like but uh, uh, using curved instruments is always uh, beneficial here i since i could get away with using only lap instruments i was doing that but uh, mainly it, it's it's personal preference so uh, when you are trying to open up the lung uh, important things are uh, removing the visceral peel so the entire visceral peel has to come off the lung has to be mobilized completely up to the hilum uh, only then it is going to nicely expand here uh, since the parietal pleura was not thickened i have done only a mechanical pleurodesis in the, the next video uh, i'll also show you a, a, a better complete decortication so this is the post op x ray on day 1 with a completely expanded lung uh, the next video is i'm sorry yeah the next video is yes So the next video is of an early stage 3 empyema this is a large loculated uh, right sided empyema and uh, this is the preliminary view so here uh, this is me getting into the chest through the anterior port and uh, here there is it's all stuck so the the uh, the key here is to create space for an additional ports so you start in through one port and then start creating space for additional ports by clearing debris once you have removed all the debris and you've got two ports in uh, you are more comfortable the entire debris fluid and everything in between the lung and the uh, parietal pleura has to be first cleared off then the next step is to start mobilizing the lung so uh, you can do that with any <coughs> blunt instrument you can use this is a uh, a blunt long uh, sponge holder you can use a long uh, artery forceps with a peanut Uh, or whatever you like. So here I'm I'm doing it with a combination of four bone stick and uh, the laparoscopic suction. So this is on the pericardial aspect. Usually there are the adhesions to the diaphragm are uh, always more dense. Uh, once the lung is mobilized, next is if possible open up the fissures to help in lung expansion. And finally, this is the decortication of the visceral pleura. So this is of utmost importance. Uh, this is the the key step. in our decortication is exactly what we do in open uh, the entire visceral pleura has to be peeled off the lung surface this was the puncture in the lung which probably caused this uh, this whole thing and uh, so this is the entire visceral pleura being peeled off here the parietal pleura was uh, quite thick so i have done a complete parietal pleurectomy as well so Uh, as against open uh, in vats so it's it's visceral first and then parietal uh, since if you do parietal first it will keep dripping into your field so this is the expanded x ray and let's at the end of the procedure uh now this empyema becomes even more chronic so it's it's there for a longer time and uh, the the pleura gets even thicker so you are uh, uh so here you can notice the difference that mobilizing the lung is is slightly more difficult so uh, you have to be very careful again here not to injure the lung uh, these are steps similar to an open decortication so i am using a the long pair of uh, scissors and uh, they are trying to do the adhesiolysis so this is on the diaphragmatic aspect if you are in the correct plane uh, you can very well use scissors you you don't require uh, an energy source this is after the lung mobilized now here the visceral peel wouldn't come off so easily so like in open decortication i had to get in between the uh, the, the lung and the visceral pleura get into the plane and uh, 
loot the edge as well as so i'm not showing you the entire video but this is how basically it is it is to be done uh, if if it doesn't come off even by doing this then you can just take crisp cross incisions on the visceral pleura and then maybe leave it alone so uh, again this is the complete visceral decortication done through the same uh, port positioning as shown earlier so what are the complications that you can face intraoperatively parenchymal tears uh, smaller ones are okay but sometimes you can have slightly uh, long larger longer ones if you are not in the correct plane so uh, have you need to identify them at the end of the procedure by doing an underwater leak test and uh, uh, suture them if required uh, bleeding is uh, is not that much of a problem especially if you are in the correct plane and uh, you you don't touch the parietal pleura first if you do parietal first then uh, uh, bleeding is an issue it will keep dripping into the field so do visceral decortication first and uh, you should not face that much of a problem i had faced the problem a bleeding problem and conversion for a bleeding in empyema only in one case so far and that patient uh, had some uh, coagulopathy so other than that usually you should not have a bleeding problem third is the peel uh, the visceral peel is too stuck to the lung uh, parenchyma now here uh, uh, i showed you in the video how to uh, we go into the plane in between the uh, the lung the, the the visceral peel and the lung but sometimes it's difficult to get into this plane uh, so either just take criss cross incisions on the uh, visceral pleura up to the lung surface here the anesthetist helps you so tell the anesthetist to start uh, inflating the lung and that is where uh, you will know uh, where you need to take these incisions and where you can uh, take off this visceral peel and at times if uh, even that is not possible then uh, uh, and if you feel that the lung is not expanding uh, do not hesitate to convert to a, a mini thoracotomy or the thoracotomy to do a good visceral decortication because at the end of the day that is the key in getting a good lung expansion and avoiding further complications as far as post op complications are concerned prolonged air leak is sometimes an issue uh, you need to keep the uh, intercostal tube for a slightly longer time uh and uh, as long as uh, on x ray you see the lung completely expanded usually prolonged air leaks should don't require a second leak you can send the patient home with the tube connected to uh, uh, a flutter bag or uh, uh, and or a hemlick wall and uh, usually these leaks stop over a period of time uh if if the lung is not completely expanded uh in in one section of the hemithorax you might develop a collection uh if the patient is asymptomatic and, and if the collection is small you can leave it alone as long as it is not infected and the patient is asymptomatic uh, also as long as the counts are normal and so on otherwise that time you need to uh, aspirate it or uh, go go after it but usually you can leave it alone uh, consolidations are a problem uh, uh, especially if the lung has been collapsed for a very long time or if the patient has got uh, active uh, tb uh, there you can end up with a consolidation post op but again uh, not very common com complication and uh, incomplete expansion i spoke about so the steps to achieve complete expansion i've already described but still sometimes you might end up uh, having an incomplete expansion if that happens uh, you have to try things like connecting the icd to uh, negative suction or uh, or things like that very rarely you might have to re intervene for uh, an incomplete expansion so to conclude uh, select the right option in the right patient at the right time uh, if there isn't there isn't enough space created so uh, if you remember as dr khan said uh, it's important to put in a finger before putting your first port so put in a finger try and create space in between the lung and the uh and the pleura to and to put in your first port next to the port you can put in your first instrument and create more space to 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 put your further ports uh visceral decortication is the key as i mentioned earlier uh get the lung to the chest wall leave no space behind uh that that is again a very key step, key point to avoid the few further complications 
uh, identify surgically treatable empyema early uh, try and save the lung we have had cases where empyemas have been neglected and left alone with lung being collapsed for a very very long time and uh, you end up having cornified lungs which are then very very messy to treat and wax is definitely safe feasible and effective even in late stage empyema uh, that is uh, that that is very very evident uh, by now thank you uh madam you are you are muted you need to unmute yourself hello dr george yeah hi uh, can you see me? so let's move ahead with uh, your topic now which is lobectomy and pneumonectomy just a second uh, can you see my screen not yet <laughs> i request every speaker to uh, please keep on with the timings because we are really running little late almost half an hour yeah uh, hi let me uh, i'm going to start off with uh, i'm supposed to show two videos which are two upper lobectomy so i can familiarize everyone who's watching with the anatomy particularly related to the pulmonary hilum uh, so i'm going to start off with the upper uniportal left upper lobectomy so it's a 79 year old lady uh, i'm going to play it a little bit faster than normal so that i can finish off a little bit faster So this is the CT scan run showing uh, you know a tiny lesion T1. So so this is the uh, position which we take. This you can see is uh, the posterior axillary line, and the incision is between the mid and the posterior axillary line. So I must stop the video and tell you this is absolutely the wrong way to make a uniportal incision. I use a uniportal incision. it's preferable not to use diatomy so that the intercostal nerve is not damaged so we have switched from this technique uh, this causes a lot of pain should avoid using diatomy while making the port uh, this is the surgical sleeve which we used to isolate the port uh, from any contamination there are two companies which provided alexis and covidin you can use whichever one it gives us adequate space to use the camera and all the other instruments as you can see i prefer uniportal technique i'm apologize for the speed Uh, with which it's being shown in a few seconds i will show you the hilum this is where we start the dissection in the anterior hilum you can see the phrenic nerve running across here ah uh, now it's better the structure that's a phrenic nerve and that's a superior pulmonary vein which you can see and uh, that's the pulmonary artery which uh, i was showing over there this is the pulmonary artery So the first job in uh, upper lobectomy is to dissect out the superior pulmonary vein. As you can see, that with the uniportal view, you can actually uh, see the vessels head on. So this is the superior pulmonary vein which uh, we are seeing. I'm going to reduce the speed a little bit. It's a little confusing. That's the superior pulmonary vein which we looked. Then we go on to the dissection of the left main pulmonary artery by taking off all the structures. so that's the left main pulmonary artery and you can see the arch of the aorta over here and this is the left main pulmonary artery so we continue dissection there and it's always easier to take off all the lymph nodes first this makes dissection of the other structures easier here you can see me identifying two branches of the pulmonary artery so in because the left upper lobe has three segments you expect three branches and two branches into the lingula lobe also total of five branches to the lingula artery yeah oh, sorry the, from the pa to be divided and one of the advantages of using a uniportal technique is that uh, you can see that i'm using a roberts to dissect preferably use vascular staplers because they are much more stable and unlikely to come off so that's one of the branches being divided here again you can see that i'm taking off the lymph nodes so that it becomes easier to dissect the vessels 
always when you use the harmonic, be absolutely sure that the active blade is away from the vessels. Otherwise, you might have a horrendous injury. Again, I'm using an open mixture. Any 9-inch instrument is adequate enough to dissect any of the vessels and for reach. Again, a vascular stapler is used, preferably one with a tip-up because it's easier to negotiate across the gap. So that means uh, you have seen two vessels divided, two of the arteries gone. Now you will see one tiny vessel here. Now the biggest problem in such surgeries is always a tiny vessels because the stapler is too big for them and a tie might actually go off. So use a small clip. Just using an energy source is not good enough, safer to clip. So use the smallest clip possible and clip those. So after dividing the upper three branches, we know that we are two more branches from the pulmonary artery. Now this is the fissure and that's the interlobar artery. So we are dividing, dissecting in between the upper lobe and the lower lobe. And the attempt is to dissect the artery so we can identify the branches to the lingula, which we expect to. So what we are seeing here is the lingula artery. That's the interlobar artery. And we are dissecting anterior to it so that the fissure is divided completely. So at this stage, I switch back because there is nothing else stopping me. And I take the superior pulmonary vein. So this is one of the rare structures which is preferable to loop. So getting the loop across gives you adequate traction and you can bring the stapler into location. So it's important, like I said earlier, to clear the lymph nodes because without taking off the lymph nodes, you might not find enough space to actually go across these structures. You will find that your instrument goes across, but your stapler doesn't go across. And this loop, the superior pulmonary vein on either side are two of the structures which actually require a loop for the stapler to go across. Now the stapler is safely across and you can see me firing it and that's the vein separated. Now again you go back to the fissure and this uh, at this point let me stop it, uh, oops, stop the video. This is uh, the superior pulmonary vein going here and this is the inferior pulmonary vein going to the lower lobe. So you are going to dissect in between so that the upper lobe is completely separated off from the lower lobe, that's the parenchyma. So that's a dissection on the interlobar artery. So that the upper lobe is completely separated off from the lower lobe. You can do the dissection with the harmonic. Sometimes when the fissure is too uh, not well developed, you can use a stapler, which is the preferred technique so that uh, the vessels are not, uh, so that there is no parenchymal leak. So you can see these small vessels again supplying the upper lobe uh, branches. Again, small one. Don't try a energy source alone. Always safer to clip. So you can see uh, that's the lingula artery over there. Again, you can use a simple Roberts. An open instrument is good enough to go across. Now that you have divided all the structures, all the vessels, you can see that's a bronchoscope shining inside. You That's the only bronchus. You pass a stapler across. Now it's a key step that once a stapler is passed across, you ask the anesthetist to inflate the lower lobe and make sure that the lower lobe ventilates. Only after confirming ventilation of the remaining lung do we actually divide the stapler. And this is the remaining hilum. And that's a resected bed. And now you continue on to doing the remaining uh, lymph node dissection, which is the posterior hilum. 
always when you use a clip you have to be make sure that after the surgery you don't so that's a space the left paratracheal space which you have reached uh, thoracoscopically and that's the remaining lymph node dissection now i'm going to stop this video here oops and i'm going to uh, show a left smlnd actually this so that is the left paratracheal space so if you can see i am between the pulmonary artery and the arch of the aorta and from there i reach the left paratracheal space and for those of you who ask a question as to how we reach a subcranial space sorry how you reach it is from anterior so this is the place so i'll stop the video here this is uh the sub superior pulmonary vein over here this is the bronchus running in this uh, direction over here and this is the area which uh is the subcranial nodes so we're doing an anterior approach and those are the subcranial nodes which can be seen there so this is a fairly complex lymph node dissection and it's initially difficult to retract the heart and the superior pulmonary vein and get there but we can essentially clear it so from this what you're seeing in the bed over here after removing the lymph nodes uh you can see it's almost a complete uh clearance is the uh, sorry that's the esophagus over there the pink fibers which you can see are the is because so i'm going to stop this video here and uh, then i'll show you the it's again a, a uniportal right upper lobe lesion uh, right re resection one key step which i forgot to mention in the uh, previous one is that you always free the inferior pulmonary ligament this make sure that the lower lobe comes up to fill the space left after the resection of the Uh, upper lobe it also helps you get time so that the uh, your rest of your team gets accustomed to the whole surgery and the angles as usual when you see operate in india you'll get adhesions which are part of the process and then you do so again uh, uh, this is the phrenic nerve which you can see this is the azygous vein and this is the svc joining it and you start dissecting it in which is the hilum again preferred that's a superior pulmonary vein upper branch which is coming to view again when you dissect uh, make sure that the active blade stays away from the vessels so you can see uh, at this point uh, this is the uppermost the first branch of the truncus of the pa coming into view and that's the low paratracheal lymph nodes just beneath the azygous i'm going to increase the speed i'm think i'm a little bit behind time so it's like i kept mentioning earlier it's easier to take out the lymph nodes first so that you expose all the vessels so the azygous bed you can do this entire dissection with a hook pottery also which is my favorite uh, instrument usually but when it's uniportal and you have only two hands to operate without an assistant in the field sometimes it's easier to use a harmonic so that's a superior pulmonary vein which is being dissected it's always important to make sure that the branch to the middle lobe is saved because if we take the middle lobe vein then it becomes difficult to salvage the middle lobe so once you exposed all the vessels this is the truncus or the first branch supplying the upper lobe and this is the superior pulmonary vein which runs almost in the same direction which we asked looping up so once you done that you continue the pleural cuts that's the bronchus which you can see over there uh, over here this uh, is the bronchus the right main bronchus then you take the posterior cuts so the lung is completely mobilized then you staple off the truncus again vascular tip up stapler is helpful again 
like I said, uh, the pulmonary vein is one of the vessels which you need to loop up because uh, it, then only it will come up to the desired angle so that the stapler goes in easily. A tip-up stapler again really helps. So those are the two main vessels looped up. Again, the lymph nodes come in and it's easier to dissect all these uh, lymph nodes first. Makes your life easier when you want to dissect uh, the main bronchus and the remaining vessels because you expect two more branches to the upper lobe. So those are the lymph nodes going up. And now you can see the upper lobe bronchus there. So this is a fissureless technique in which I don't, uh, I have not dissected the fissure, but since I'm sure this is the upper lobe bronchus, I'm clamping it. And like in the previous case, I have decided to ventilate and the anesthetist has shown me middle lobe getting ventilated and then I divide it. So that's the interlobar artery coming into view. But I still suspect one more branch to be going to the upper lobe. So that is the branch. That's a posterior ascending artery which supplies the middle lobe. Now, uh, to ensure that's going up to the upper lobe, I dissect in the fissure. And this is the fissure and the interlobar PA running in the fissure. Since this patient had reasonably well-developed fissures, you can see that the dissection is easy and I've reached right across to the posterior pleural space. See, that's the stump of the artery. So in this case, the fissure is not that well done like in the first case. So uh, I use a stapler to divide and separate the upper and the lower lobes. So once that is done, I now know for sure uh, that the lower branch, which you, oh, sorry. The lower branch, which you see over here is actually segment six branch going to the lower lobe. And this one over here is the segment three branch. So at this point, I decide I have to take this, uh, the upper one, which you can see. So that's the importance of dividing the fissure. Again, I uh, do not divide it. Dr. Uh, George. Not getting a clip. Sorry. Dr. George, you will have to be a little faster. Oh, I'm sorry. So I think that's all the vessels taken. And uh, that's the final uh, stapler going in between the middle lobe and the lower lobe. Sorry, upper lobe. And I guess that's the upper lobectomy specimen uh, coming out. So that's the hilum remaining, all the hyla structures divided. And as uh, explained by all the previous uh, speakers, we use a uh, pack to take out the specimen. Do I have enough time or to do the lymph node dissection or can I stop here? Uh, no, actually, we don't have time. Okay, excellent. So I will stop here. Apologies for overstepping my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in the A to Z of uh, thoracoscopy, we will be able to give good justice to all the topics. Uh, this being an introductory scene. Now we move to the next speaker, Dr. Bhushan Thogre, yeah. who is going to talk upon pneumothorax and bully. Thank you, Dr. George. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Thogre, you are there? Yes. Please yeah, okay. start. I am just uh, sharing my screen. Hold on a second. Yes. Yeah. Greetings. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arun Prasad, Dr. Jayashree Torkar, and uh, Dr. Ali Zabir Khan and uh, all the IIGS team members. Uh, greetings from Medanta Medicity. Uh, this talk is dedicated to all teachers who have taught me thoracic surgery since last 10 to 12 years. So I'll be talking about uh, pneumothorax and uh, the management of uh, bullet. So everybody uh, knows uh, in a thoracic surgical practice or any general surgical practice, you will come across an emergent situation where a patient will uh, land up in emergency breathless, uh, will have subcutaneous emphysema, his saturations might be dropping and will be called uh, that you need to put a chest drain immediately. Uh, once in a while, uh, you may be 
for for this uh, condition uh, which chestrens is a salvage procedure which saves a person's life immediately from a uh, uh, complication like tension pneumothorax so you can see this x rays there is a pneumothorax so pneumothorax is defined as abnormal collection of air in pleural cavity everybody knows uh, itar a student of lenek who first coined the term pneumothorax and lenek described this picture there's a pneumothorax first of all i will go with little bit the orientation about classification it is spontaneous and acquired in spontaneous we have primary and secondary in primary those who do not have clinical lung disease so there might be a rupture of subpleural blebs or bullae and in secondary there is a pre existing lung disease which the lung will be some disease process bullous lung disease cystic disease malignancy infectious causes or maybe some connective tissue uh, disorders and uh, maximum uh, number of causes uh, uh, causes of pneumothorax 82 uh, 80% are uh, traumatic uh, then like, comes the iatrogenic and then the bar barotrauma so traumatic are uh, both blunt and penetrating trauma both uh, might be road traffic acid accidents or missile or gunshot injuries iatrogenic uh, we know uh, due to uh, during any uh, intervention radiological procedures or bedside pleural aspirations or diagnostic procedures or after a laparoscopic surgery where diaphragm might have uh, congenital fenestrations and nowadays due to covid situation everywhere in the world we are uh, getting increased referrals uh, or barotrauma induced uh, pneumothorax uh, that is due to ventilator and due to primary pathology uh, affecting covid affecting the lungs so diagnosis of pneumothorax is generally mainly clinical it is auscultation clinical examination and strong suspicion and then comes the chest x ray and the ct thorax once the patient is settled that is what there are many treatment options for pneumothorax one small pneumothorax less than 10% you can observe that might be after any some needle procedure something needle aspiration uh, i personally don't advocate although theoretically they mention uh, small pneumothorax uh, uh, you can aspirate them we recommend is a, a chest drainage a chest tube insertion uh, and chest tube size we uh, generally bts guidelines and all this uh, guidelines mention about 24 to 20 uh, number chest tubes but we recommend 28 number chest uh, drainage uh, system uh, connected to underwater seal then pleurodesis also comes in the uh, one part of management as we will, as i will go uh, in the video demonstration then thoracoscopy thoracotomy uh, with bulla bullectomy and pleurodesis both either mechanical or chemical or with or without pleurectomy so tension pneumothorax i would like to mention it is a dreaded complication it is due to large air leak the, most of the times it is mainly on ventilator diagnosis is always clinical Uh, and immediate decompression via chest tube has to be made that's one chest drain insertion everybody knows uh, remains the main strain uh, treatment in management of pneumothorax fifth intercostal space in the triangle of safety and connecting to a underwater uh, seal uh, drain con container so now indications for operative intervention in case of a pneumothorax is persistent air leak that is greater than 3 to 5 days a failure of lung to fully re expand in spite of chest drainage and in spite of negative oh, suction uh, uh, applied applied to the chest drain hydro pneumothorax or any pneumothorax is getting complicated the recurrent ipsilateral pneumothorax or bilateral spontaneous pneumothorax or first occurrence of contralateral pneumothorax or some at risk professions like pilots or divers or any person who has history of one side pneumothorax and has a Uh, bulla or uh, ct diagnosed pathology on the other side uh, which can land up the patient to an emergency uh, who has a poor access to the medical treatment we should consider for operative treatment so you can see there uh, this was a boy who had a recurrent pneumothorax he had underwent two or three times chest drain insertion when he landed up the third time we decided to uh, do a thoracoscopy because he had continued air leak and we can see there is was a small bulla uh, lying in the left lower lobe uh, segment 
then this is another example of uh, one uh, bulla uh, so bulle uh, yeah, there are these are focal regions of emphysema with no discernible wall they are around 1 to more than 1 to 2 cm diameter and uh, pulmonary blebs are generally less than 1 or 2 cm diameter both are subpleural uh, and a giant bulla is like one that occupies more than third of uh, uh, volume of the hemithorax so this can be called as a very giant bulla so some complications if you don't treat bulle or sometimes sometimes very rarely they get complicated by infection in the bulla and uh, that may lead to empyema this was one of the case uh, with a uh, long standing bulla which got infected and we did have, we had to did uh, do a decortication and we found out there is a infected bulla lying inside so in treatment do not put chest drain in a silent bulla always distinguish what is a pneumothorax and what is a bulla if you are in doubt do a ct scan uh, when the patient is stable so if pneumothorax then chest drain placement allow the lung to expand do a ct thorax operative bulla seen if bulla are not seen in pneumothorax and air leak stops lung fully expands observe if recurrent then operate so do we need to treat other side as well only in certain occupations like pilots and those engage in the diving sports uh, we need to operate or uh, those who has poor access to the healthcare facility so th this is a case of 29 year old young lady with no comorbidities had recurrent right sided pneumothorax with chest drain insertions and came landed with us with a mild breathlessness on opd basis we did a ct scan we saw multiple bullae and subcutaneous emphysema extending up to the neck this is the actual view of the ct scan and this is the uh, coronal view which showed multiple bullae at the apex and some pneumothorax component so we decided uh, to do a thoracoscopy uh, we did via unilateral uniportal approach so you can see multiple bullae at the uh, apex you can grab those bullae the, they won't rupture the uh, the walls are very much uh, not very fragile this thing and rest of the bullae uh, we had ligated even ligation of bulla is mentioned in literature where there is a uh, famous japanese study in uh, uh, available online where they have compared the ligation of bulla versus stapling of bulla that is all so we are introducing the stapler uh across the bulla taking the whole of the back uh, uh, is to be taken so that your uh, suture line doesn't give way you adjust the staples accordingly so that the whole and uh, all the bullas uh, bullae element is within the stapler then you should see all the borders of the stapler before firing it and once you have stapled the bulla any residual tissue can be cut with scissors keeping the stapled line on the lung side then you should ask your anesthetist to inflate the lung uh, you have to put uh, uh, you have to check for any air leaks by uh, adding water into the thorax that is called a air leak test if there is no leak in the thorax then you can move ahead with your our next option that is what to uh, for pleurodesis uh, either you can go mechanical pleurodesis or chemical pleurodesis okay yeah so the complications after this surgery are persistent space problems if you have stapled lot of uh, apical lung there will be a space problem there might be again air leak if you are not check the whole lung surfaces all the areas properly there might be some small bulla which you have not uh, attended it or your staple line might have given away or a uh, long standing pneumothorax a non expansion of the lung may be problems so before uh, attempting any uh, lung surgery for bulla you should have the knowledge about the staplers and which type of cartridges you should use these are available all online you can 
go to any of those uh, branded available staplers they have similar so, color comrade, codings yeah again uh, times up yes. yeah okay okay i will run yeah so aberration pleurodesis uh, is a one of the option uh, for uh, this thing you can <laughs> abrasion pleurodesis by taking a gauze piece and abrading the surface of the pleura to make it rough so that lung adheres to the chest wall you to make sure that lot of pleura has been abraded mainly the apexes where the uh, airway tension is very high it should look like red and it should start bleeding blood also acts as a pleurodesis agent so talc can be used magnesium silicate slurry uh, uh, i don't advocate slurry i advocate uh, powderage by medical thoracoscopy or wax for pneumothorax you can use 2 gram uh, this should be uh, deferred for old people where you do not expect any other further surgery for young patients you reserve uh, pleurectomy or uh, abrasion pleurodesis so this is one video of talc powderage uh sorry this video is some um, um, for malignant diffusion but uh, this is an example how you have to do powderage so you have to create a hail hail storm like appearance in the chest so that all powder particles are spread across evenly along the lung surface and as well as the whole of the pleura whole of the diaphragm under surface of the lung and along the hilum and the mediastinal pleura so that uh, there is no pleural space so there will be no uh, uh, pneumothorax later so this is a made indian jugad of uh, spraying the powder you can apply co2 insufflator uh, to this also and spray the uh, talc so complications of talc are the, these all fever pain shortness of breath hemoptysis there are many complications so this is our outcome of three port wax this is uniportal wax and i would like to mention about digital th thoracic suction devices we use often after our Uh, bullectomy and pleurectomy surgery this key helped us to keep the lung expanded and adhered for the first 24 to 48 hours so that recurrent pneumothoraxes after icd removal our chances are very less so again the covid and pneumothorax the incidence is low subcutaneous emphysema more common pneumothorax unilateral bilateral very high mortality with these type of patients thank you stay safe pray live long thank you Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Bhushan, and uh, thank you very much for typically mentioning about the some suction, low suction. Okay, very important for this uh, thoracoscopic surgery. We move to the next session, which is thoracoscopic video lectures, non-lung. Uh, requesting Doctor Sabita to please take over thoracoscopic esophagectomy. Uh, can you see my screen? Ah. Uh, we can see you oh i'm so sorry one minute sharing my screen yes yeah so good evening everyone and thank you dr jayshree for organizing this and inviting me so i will be talking about a thoracoscopic esophagectomy with a three field lymphadenectomy and just to get started uh, surgery for esophageal cancer involves removal of the disease esophagus with an adequate margin continue maintaining the continuity of the gastrointestinal tract and making provision for the patient's feeding post operatively and since afternoon we are listening why we are uh, talking about thoracoscopy so these pictures are self explanatory and i don't need to talk more about this we already know that thoracoscopy has better outcomes when it comes to esophageal cancer surgery there's decreased pain decreased blood loss fewer pulmonary complications a shorter icu and hospital stay it is oncologically equivalent and now there's level 1 evidence from these two randomized controlled trials that there is decreased pulmonary complications also coming to the technical details these are the typical ports that we use for a thoracoscopic esophagectomy when done in the lateral position so you could choose any of the three positions lateral semi prone or prone it depends on your expertise and your preference traditionally we were taught that the lateral position is the best when dealing with complications because it closely resembles an open surgery but actually if you are experienced in open surgery the position should not make much of a difference the only caveat being that a prone position is always more difficult for the anesthetist to manage the airway 
you can use any number of ports from four to six and now there are reports of uniportal uh, esophagectomy also coming in lung isolation with a bronchial blocker or a double lumen tube is preferred and you could also utilize capnothorax when your lung isolation or lung collapse is not very great so please do not rule out capnothorax it's a useful adjunct in many cases so coming to the video itself uh, this is a post neoadjuvant chemotherapy bulky lower thoracic esophageal cancer and as you can see there were some lung adhesions which we have already released uh, we start by incising the medial aspect of the mediastinal pleura at the border of the lung so as to get a clear avascular plane where you will see the pericardium and also this will give you a good circumferential resection margin so you could take the lymph nodes along with the esophagus or you could take them out separately it is your personal preference and uh, depends on your expertise so now you can see the glistening pericardium which has come into view as we are lifting off the esophagus there will be some um, vessels on the pericardial side also and these need to be cauterized and you go on mobilizing till you reach the far end of the pericardium okay and at the level of the bronchus you'll see the vagus as well as a few vessels accompanying it so there the white the white structure here is the right main bronchus and there are lymph nodes along that the subcarinal packet of lymph nodes there's along with the vagus there'll always be a small blood vessel so that needs to be cauterized or clipped be very careful using energy devices in this area because there's potential of damaging the posterior wall of the bronchus which we all know is membranous so slowly you take this uh, vagus and its accompanying vessel off and it's possible most of the time to see the left main bronchus anti from the anterior view it is also e equally okay if you can if you start by incising the lateral pericardium a uh, lateral uh, um, uh, pleura but uh, usually i prefer to mobilize it anteriorly and then take the lateral cuts when you take the lateral cuts you can see the azygous vein running down the thoracic cavity vertically and below is the descending aorta so unless your tumor is very bulky or it is very advanced which is usually not seen nowadays in the era of new adjuvant therapy you may sometimes need to take this fibro fatty tissue or block with the esophagus which contains the chyle duct so you keep mobilizing the lateral pleural cut till you see the pleura of the opposite side uh, even if you open the pleura of the opposite side it's okay just be sure that you inform the anesthetist so uh, they have a clue about it and they can remind you to put an icd on the opposite side also there will be direct branches coming off from the descending aorta and these can be cauterized either with a harmonic or a hook whichever one you prefer but make sure they are cauterized well some branches may also need clipping coming to the suprazygous mobilization uh, you need to open the pleura in the posterior mediastinum usually that's safer because anterior is the trachea you make a u shaped cut over the azygous okay and then you mobilize the esophagus from the posterior aspect of the thorax where it really tends to dip down in the suprazygous part and then you take it off from the fascia between the trachea and the esophagus so one key point which i always tell my residents in the suprazygous part whatever you think is the esophagus may actually be the trachea so be really really careful over there and uh, make a good space if you are planning to take the azygous vein so you can save the azygous vein but there are certain indications where you will definitely want to take it one is um, when you have a bulky middle third tumor so there may be lymphatics and lymph nodes in this area so it's better to take the azygous vein when you are dissecting the second uh, important indication which is not a absolute indication is when you are doing a three field lymphadenectomy it just gives you more space if you have taken the azygous vein and also if you have a bulky patient who will have a large omentum accompanying the gastric tube that you make so if the azygous is intact it may actually uh, constrict the blood vessels now after taking the azygous i am taking the thoracic duct here the anatomical landmarks for taking the thoracic duct are the azygous vein which is running down and the descending aorta so whatever fibro fatty tissue you see in between the azygous and the aorta okay you just loop it and till you see the wall of the aorta from this side and take the whole tissue together if you try and dissect the chyle duct separately you may actually end up injuring it uh, you can use metallic clips but hemlock clips are preferable 
and also the chyle duct taking the chyle duct is a matter of preference so you may choose to preserve it if you think you have not injured it this is the area of the right recurrent nerve so this is the right vagus you go up the right vagus and you see fibro fatty tissue and lymph nodes towards the apex of the thorax okay and that is the subclavian artery pulsating on top so as we all know and dr anjali pointed out the right recurrent will go below the uh, subclavian we saw it there a glimpse of the right uh, uh, recurrent nerve so you take out the fibro fatty tissue there along with the lymph nodes you clear that and uh, be careful not to use energy devices a uh, combination of blunt and sharp dissection now coming posterior to the trachea you retract the trachea gently with a suction or a retractor you take the esophagus up and you can see the left recurrent nerve which runs on the left posterior border of the trachea so here yeah it's coming into view you can see the nerve with a small blood vessel over it and it's important to remove remember not to hold the nerve directly use your uh, very uh, vascular forceps or scanlan forceps to hold the perineural tissue the adventitia around the nerve but don't hold the nerve directly and also lymph nodes are most commonly found in the groove between the nerve and the trachea so don't look only lateral to the nerve that's not where most of the lymph nodes will be the lymph nodes will be in between the trachea and the nerve and that's how the trachea actually ends up getting devascularized during this three well three field lymphadenectomy so you can see this patient has a lot of lymph nodes and you are all you know literally end up stripping the nerve trying to remove so be very careful don't use energy devices blunt dissection and then a few sharp cuts you may encounter bleeding in this area but the best thing is just to uh, swab it give some pressure and then go back to dissecting these are small vessels which will typically not bleed a lot but if you try to cauterize them you may end up injuring the nerve itself so this is all the uh, dissection along the left recurrent i'll go a little faster because uh, in the interest of time and now we have come to the aortopulmonary window so to dissect the aortopulmonary window what you need to do is retract the left main bronchus so this suction here is retracting the left main bronchus and then you open this space up by retracting the left main bronchus you can see the arch of aorta pulsations on top so this space is typically below the arch of aorta and in the depth is the main pulmonary artery so you can see these lymph nodes coming up again you will encounter the left recurrent laryngeal nerve here as it hooks around the arch aorta so careful dissection least use of energy devices and uh, carefully dissect out the nodes while preserving the nerve so again you may tend to encounter some bleeding but just give pressure be patient and uh, slowly dissect out the nodes because even in depth you have a fragile structure which is the pulmonary artery whose adventitia and wall is not as you know uh, strong as the arch aorta so uh, you may actually end up injuring it while you are working in this depth in the aorta pulmonary window so you identify the nerve here you clear out the lymph nodes and then you come to the subcarinal area and take out the subcarinal lymph nodes to complete your three field lymphadenectomy that is between the two bronchi if you have not already taken these nodes along with the specimen so uh, just a small one minute video on how we mobilize the stomach for uh, making the gastric conduit so this is a laparoscopic mobilization you go along the greater omentum at least 1 and 1/2 2 cm below the right gastroepiploic artery arcade because that is the main blood supply to the future conduit so you keep going along the greater omentum and you mobilize towards the pylorus you need to mobilize because otherwise your stomach will not reach the neck then you take the short gastric vessels which are coming from the splenic artery and be careful not to injure the spleen here so uh, then you open the lesser omentum and once you open this lesser omentum you'll be able to see the left gastric vessels here uh, when you're dissecting the left gastric vessels just uh, take all the lymphatic and fibro fatty tissue upwards towards the specimen because that will be taken off when you form your gastric conduit so this, this is the left gastric vein the left gastric artery is usually behind this is uh, clipping the left gastric artery and uh, once you clip it i usually don't divide it i just keep the clips on and do the d2 lymphadenectomy 
So when you're doing the D2 lymphadenectomy, just roll the pancreas down like you do in an open D lymphadenectomy. You will see the hepatic, common hepatic coming into view and take all the fibro fatty tissue above the common hepatic. So you just roll down the pancreas, take it off. And then finally, you mobilize the hiatus where you should take care not to cut the diaphragmatic fibers, not to cut the muscle because this can, this unidentified uh, uh, mistake can actually lead to a post-operative hi hiatus hernia. So just go along the peritoneum and take your cuts there. Completing the surgery, you mobilize the esophagus in the neck, you loop it, then you will retrieve the specimen, you will form the gastric tube and then you can do a cervical anastomosis, either hand swing or staple, it completely depends on you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Savita. You did it I mean, in your time. Thanks a lot. Now, actually, we are moving to uh, the next topic, that is thymectomy by Dr. Arun Prasad. I want to uh, tell all the audience and the faculty to please stay uh, logged in because we are going to take all the questions at the end. So over to Dr. Arun Prasad now. Thank you. I'll start. Start sharing my screen. Is my screen and audio all right? Can somebody confirm? We can yes, hear you. And you can see the screen as well? Yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. So I have got this video to show about thymectomy and while the video is going on I will be talking a few words. My job has been made very easy by the fantastic anatomy presentation which was the first talk of this uh, meeting today and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk today. I have also learned a lot from the previous speakers so without wasting more time let me move ahead with my video. So when we talk about thoracoscopic uh, thymectomy, first thing is that the patient is in the supine position. The surgeon can either be on the right, which is what I prefer. There are three ports which I use for access. The telescopic port in the fifth intercostal space and anterior axillary line and two other ports on either side of that. This is the phrenic nerve and that is the upper edge of the pericardium and that is the thymic area. So this is the anatomy that needs to be remembered. You start your surgery at the angle between the nerve and the pericardium, what I call as the pericardiophrenic angle. So if you could see that angle, I've just pulled up the pleura there and this is where we should start. So this is a crucial point there. So this is the next point which is lift the thymus and the fat from the floor. So when you lift it off the floor, you will find this loose areolar tissue. There are small arteries which can either be clipped or coagulated. Arteries are never a problem and most of the time you can do the entire surgery without the need to clip any artery, just your harmonic should be enough. However, sometimes you see large arteries like this and it's always better to clip it. You proceed further till the left lung is visualized on the straight ahead and the left phrenic nerve is also visualized there. The left thymic vein is clipped and cut. Now the left thymic vein is the largest vein, which the largest vascular structure which you are going to face when you are doing a thymectomy surgery. And hence, I feel that the left thymic vein clipping is most crucial. The right one is usually again very small and can be uh, secured with your harmonic. So you've gone to the opposite side, you see the lung there, see the left phrenic nerve, get the left thymic vein and then start moving back. Sometimes the light thymic vein is also large, so you may need to clip that too. But as I said to you, 
these two, the thymic arterial supply and the right thymic vein, most cases you should be able to just get it with your harmonic. There are these large fat cells which go along with the thymus gland. They should be removed. In the periphery, sometimes you see small uh, fat cells which are actually subpleural fat that depending upon the BMI of the patient, it may be a lot. So you don't have to chase that. The specimen is removed inside a specimen bag. And you can see during hemostasis, you should be able to see the peri bare pericardium there. You can see the phrenic nerve there, the right thymic vein, the arch of aorta should be pulsating, pink, it looks pink and pulsatile, the innominate vein should be bared, and the left thymic vein straight ahead. Then you can see the left sided pleura and the lung on the opposite side. At the end, any remaining fat which you can see, you can excise easily. You should remove it, especially when you are doing this surgery for myasthenia gravis. If you are doing it for thymoma, then you need not chase the excessive fat. Check for bleeding. So that's the specimen which comes out. And if you play, place it on the table, it looks like this. These are the port positions again you see. The 10 mm to 5 mm ports, which you have, we have put. Now, thymectomy these days is also nicely done robotically. And I now prefer robotic thymectomy if whenever possible. So, we'll show you a video again. The anatomy and the steps remain the same. However, you can see this video by the thymectomy. Now, here, the left shoulder, the robot is going to come. The right arm has to be placed in a lower position so that it does not clash with the robotic arms. So this is the robot which has been wheeled in. This is known as docking of the robot where the robotic arms are connected to the robotic ports. Instruments are introduced. So as you can see, there are three port technique. So there's a harmonic, there's a grasper, and there's a telescope. Now again, you can see the innominate vessels. You can see the ribs, apex of lung, the uh, sympathetic chain. Identify the pericardium there. You identify the phrenic nerve. Go to the pericardiophrenic angle. That's where the thymus lies. And that's where you enter the mediastinum. So this is a thymoma which we are removing. As you can see that lumpy structure there. Go flush in that loose avascular areolar tissue till you see the arch of aorta. And now you can lift the off the arch of aorta there. <coughs> Going on towards the left side. Taking it off the left pleural surface. Entering the superior mediastinum, freeing the from the innominate vein, now freeing from the innominate vein, I feel that we should do from <coughs> below, otherwise there is a risk of entering the innominate vein if you go from above. And as you are freeing, once the entire thymus is freed, you will see the thymic vein there and that is being clipped. So in this particular case, we did not encounter any large vein on the left side, but we found the vein on the right side. So this is a thymoma which has been excised. Not much blood loss. This is quite an avascular space. Specimen is put into a sterile bag and removed from one of the trocar sites. Many surgeons do it with four ports, but I think three is enough in most cases. This is another case where we are doing it from the left side because the thymoma was predominantly on the left side of the patient. 
most surgeries as i said i am happy doing it from the right side this is the upper lobe of the lung the left subclavian artery that's our node of the aorto pulmonary window this is the left phrenic nerve the pericardium again we go into the pericardio phrenic angle and do this inferior dissection then go medially finally the superior dissection put it in a bag and remove it again this was a thymoma so fairly simple surgery if you've got your ports correctly so there are few tips which i have got for people who are starting to do thymectomy surgery first one is your port placement is extremely important put in the first port as i showed you in the fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line once the telescope is inside plan your other two ports there is no fixed rule about where the other two ports should be so put in the telescope look inside see how you get the best triangulation if and the target of your triangulation should be the thymic vein or the innominate vein so with that target you plan your other two ports and do it in a nice triangulated fashion following all the basic principles of minimal laxative surgery so there should be no clash of instruments this clash of instruments uh, tip is even more important when we are talking about the robotic procedure and one way to prevent clash of instruments in the robotic is keep your right hand instrument absolutely as low as possible just above the diaphragm in the anterior axillary line or so and keep your left instrument almost in the axilla so for that the right arm should be placed in a below the table angulation and place this in the uh, right axilla another tip would be that if you put a 12 mm port in the right mm -hmm. axilla third instrument you can use the same port to take out the specimen with the bag and even enlarge it and being in the axilla it hardly leaves any visible scar start at the pericardio phrenic angle that is the most crucial point and most surgeons who have trained with me call it my angle and uh, always suggest that remember this angle if you enter from this angle the anatomy and the subsequent dissection becomes very easy cross over to the left side to show the phrenic nerve be aware of the thymic vein the innominate vein dissection should be from below the th no no thyroid thymus i have written thyroid by mistake and the innominate vein dissection should be from below so you lift up the uh, gland with one hand and dissect under it because if you are dissecting over it there is always a risk of going into the uh, innominate vein so to conclude i would like to say minimal access surgery of thymus is one of the best examples for advantages so when there are talks about how minimal access surgery has changed uh, the way surgery is practiced over the last 20 30 years the best example i can give is that of a thymectomy in fact the benefits of the thymectomy minimal access surgery is far more than the benefit of even laparoscopic cholecystectomy which is used as the 
classic example. So I would actually, I always give the example of hymectomy and bariatric surgery as the two areas where minimal access surgery has really revolutionized the way surgery is practiced. There is a learning curve, so you should have a mentor with you during the learning curve. You should have adequate thoracotomy skills, or if you are not comfortable with thoracotomy, have a thoracic surgeon to provide you backup whenever required. With that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much. Be safe. Use your masks, gloves, sanitizers, social distancing in these pandemic areas. All the best. Thank you very much, Dr. Arun for the very nice presentation and I agree totally with you that thymus is one of the most uh, benefited surgeries as far as minimally invasive technique is concerned for the patient, for the doctor, for the precision, safety and the post-operative outcomes also. I remember just one thing to share here. Uh, in the SAGES in 2003, I had presented the video of the total thoracoscopic thymectomy for myasthenia gravis, unilateral approach. And that was uh, awarded with the best video presentation, best technique. And I'm very happy to share with you all that it is still in the Sages Pearls in the library in the name of uh, me and my team. So it's really one of the great pleasures to see thymectomy and do it again and again. Moving to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Shilpa Gandhi. She is going to talk on Kylothorax. Uh, thank Shilpa, you. are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Hey, Shilpa. Please. Please. Yeah, yeah. I'll just start uh, sharing my screen first. Yeah. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can yeah. see the screen also. Yeah, great. Can you make so, it full screen? Oh, yes. Please. Yes. Nice. I'm, uh, I'm Shilpa Gandhi and I'm a thoracic surgeon from India and I've recently migrated to UK as a clinical fellow in thoracic surgery. I uh, have immense gratitude towards Arun Prasad sir, Jayashree Thodkar madam and entire IGS team to invite me as a faculty speaker. Uh, this uh, uh, meet is very nostalgic because I'm seeing a lot of uh, old faces. I could never imagine <laughs> coming across Thodkar ma'am after a gap of at least a decade. I'm a very, very old student. Probably she may not be even uh, recognizing my uh, face. <laughs> oh, okay. So coming to Kylothorax, uh, this is one entity which you can clearly describe as the tip of an iceberg. You will see and you know what you see, but there is much more to it as far as management of Kylothorax is concerned. It's a huge process and I will take you to this journey throughout my talk. Uh, beginning to the um, introduction to the chylothorax is nothing but accumulation of chyle in the pleural space because of the obstruction or injury to the uh, thoracic duct. It's not an exciting complication, even if it is rare, at least four to five percent of the, these patients. But these can be serious and if not well attended, they can actually be life threatening. Uh, post titrogenic or post surgical complications are by far the most common etiology followed by neoplastic and idiopathic. Coming to a brief anatomy of the thoracic duct, it is a tubular structure uh, starting against the L2 body upper vertebra uh, in the abdomen uh, from the cisterna chyla and then it ascends in the posterior mediastinum, it's just staying anterior to the vertebral body but on the right side and it ascends to the aortic hiatus. Then it crosses from uh, the right to the left against the T4 vertebra, where it stays uh, above uh, against the aortic, behind the aortic arch and left to the esophagus. This is the uh, site of injury mostly uh, in aortic arch surgeries as well as in some esophagectomy surgeries too. Coming to its termination and co uh, just like its uh, variable course, it, ha it has a variable termination also. Ideally, it ends in medial to the scalenus anticus muscle, uh, just deep to the neck uh, at the jugular subclavian angle, staying within the two centimeters of this uh, landmark. However, this duct can, uh, can enter directly into any nearby vein, either independently into internal jugular vein or subclavian vein or any other nearby vein. So you have to be very, very well versed with the anatomy, its uh, origin course, as well as uh, termination. 
Coming to chyle, it's nothing but fat, which is cholesterol predominant, for, uh, but it also has a lot of T cells and fat soluble vitamins as well as electrolytes. At least 1.5 to 2.5 liters of it is produced per day. The, base, the literature shows an extensive list of an etiology of chylothorax. I've just uh, simplified it by dividing into a classification of congenital, which is less common, but they are mostly syndromic in association, post-traumatic or nothing but post iatrogenic this, this, this is by far the most common uh, segment of etiology. And uh, wherein esophagectomy uh, is comprised of nine, one to nine percent of the incidence of these cases and uh, followed by a po uh, post uh, coronavirus artery bypass surgery. Uh, then tuberculosis, of course, can lead to any in, uh, disease entity, including chylothorax, then advanced uh, mediastinal lymph nodes or advanced lung cancers. And then uh, sarcoidosis or amyloidosis can also give rise to chylothorax as a rare presentation. Coming to clinical features of presentation, it will definitely have a prior history if it is post iatrogenic. Uh, these patients are usually they present at the after day seven or day seven onwards. Uh, so it has a very insidious onset. But once it presents, it can have a very rapid accumulation. So depending upon if it's a low volume, it could be silent uh, where these patients, they do not uh, require any kind of an intervention. Or if it is high volume symptomatic, then you have to be alert. Uh, coming to laboratory examination, appearance of the fluid in the form of milky white uh, discharge from the chest drainage is the ideal, uh, very characteristic of chylothorax. These, when you do analysis of these fluid, they will show T cell predominant, at least 80% of them, and the count will be more than 1,000 uh, cells. Presence of chylomicrons is actually the most ideal in, uh, investigation of choice, which is rampantly available in um, majority of the institutes. Hence, we take as a plural fluid uh, ratio or the plural fluid content of triglyceride as well as cholesterol as a diagnostic modality. We also should keep into mind an entity uh, called a pseudochylothorax when, whereby uh, this ratio will get uh, or these values will get uh, uh, exactly entirely reversed. Coming to basic imaging, so uh, not mandatory, but yes, many uh, institutes, they do uh, advise doing a lymphangiogram. It could be a CT lymphangiogram or MR lymphangiogram. These are very less invasive and they will give you the site of uh, leak, the complete anatomical uh, course of the duct, as well as include uh, inclusive of the aberrant uh, anomalies associated with the duct. Um, one thing to mention is about the 3D spec, wherein you can actually get to some more information about the functional uh, component of the thoracic duct. Coming to straightforward indications of uh, operating these patients. Yes, these patients, if left unattended, they can be very uh, notorious. Nutritional imbalance can happen on prolonged conservative management, which will give rise to loss of fat and fat-soluble vitamins, as well as uh, the T lymphocytes. These patients, they hence can uh, give uh, land up in risk of uh, septicemia complications. Then, of course, as mentioned before, post esophagectomy are the upfront cases for operative repair. Uh, and uh, anything uh, above 800 ml per day in the chest strain for consecutive five days, you should be alarm. It should be alarming, and it should be considered as a threshold for uh, operative repair. And of course, failure of maximal medical therapy. Coming to initial approach, like I said before, before taking the patient for surgery. You must uh, stabilize the general condition by putting the patient on by mouth or at least a medium chain triglyceride diet, and then you thereby from uh, you observe. Uh, some page, some people do advise or they give an additional somatostatin analogs uh, infusion like octreotide infusion to reduce the production of the chyle. Then at this stage, lymphangiogram should be done so that you get the entire anatomical uh, delineation uh, of the and as well as the site of the perforation. And this is also the stage where if it is low volume, you can actually directly consider for a thoracic duct embolization. Uh, coming to identification of the leak. So uh, having said that, visualization of the leak is the ideal, but nevertheless, very frequently encountered situation. Of course, you will be able to, if you're lucky, you'll, you can be uh, able to see a milky white discharge from one particular site in suppose the mid or lower uh, thora thoracic cavity just at the site of the perforation. However, this is not very ideal, like I said before. So many people, they uh, do uh, give high uh, dose of talc, milk, or uh, 
um, high cream through the trials tube just 15 to 20 minutes prior to the surgery and after that you are able to uh, see the leakage of this talc through the site of the perforation in place of talc some people can incorporate using if it depends upon the uh, availability um, if it is available then dyes can be used uh, like icg of course like i said before lymphangiogram will uh, definitely clear clear uh, the picture if it has been done before coming to which compartment to address to so this is the organ or the duct which actually travels three compartments from uh, abdomen to thorax to uh, neck so but since we are actually the most commonly and uh, uh, compartment to be addressed and very very ideally and easy to address is definitely the trans thoracic approach so when we talk about the vats ligation or the thoracic uh, ligation which side to uh, which side to take into account first of course many people think that it could be um, the one with the chest tube but ideal is ideal and again easy uh, is to address the right sided thoracic duct why because it's solitary it is not duplicated and it has a much more constant course as against the left sided however in cases of cabgs any side can have uh, present as a chylothorax coming to surgical approach it could be open vats or robotic depending upon the surgeon expertise underlying etiology and the patient demand here however these kind of cases are actually very easily dealt with uh, thoracoscopic approach hence these usually are in majority of the uh, centers majority of the thoracic surgeons they actually do, uh, deal with it by vats uh, plain simple vats ligation again uh, when we we talk about thoracoscopic we have already discussed in uh, great uh, details the, about the anterior and posterior approach in all of our previous talks uh, i would be here more stressing uh, in the anterior approach this is the right sided vats anterior approach this these are just pictorial images to uh, make you understand about the port placements mm -hmm. so the basic uh, uh, principle of port placement and for uh, thoracic duct ligation is that our target organ and the site of the ligation it is much much below just above the diaphragm so you have to so all the ports uh, they are uh, as compared to the conventional they go a little one one space below so for example we have uh, in, in this case we did a utility incision much below uh, in the seventh space uh, but still uh, staying anterior to the anterior axillary line and secondly yes anterior approach why because the surgeon has to stand anteriorly because your organ or the target organ is placed much much behind that is in the posterior media sternum coming to the setup setup doesn't require too much of fancy instruments just a 10 mm of 30 degree telescope is fair enough along with your basic vats instruments and one endoscopic clip applicator uh so what we do is we just uh, first we first divide the inferior pulmonary ligament uh, retract the lung anteriorly we identify the posterior mediastinal pleura and divide it uh, at any case you have to reach to the esophagus to press the diaphragm i will uh, uh, explain this in much detail in this uh, video so this video uh, was a case this was a case of left sided uh, chylothorax post cabg uh, which we had seen it in Manipal hospitals last year in 2009. So this case was done by a right-sided VATS interior approach uh, along with Dr. Prasad. So in this, I, as I mentioned, the previous ports placements, uh, we had with uh, three ports. Uh, so here what we are doing is we have identified and we have already divided inferior pulmonary ligament now this is the posterior mediastinal pleura we have identified and we are uh, trying to uh, divide it. So we were actually very lucky to have a very virgin right-sided pleural cavity because it was a left-sided uh, chylothorax. And hence the entire anatomy is very clearly identified and the structures are very clean. However, and this may not be the case if it is a right-sided one and you can actually uh, struggle in finding uh, the, the esophagus or you, know, uh, you may actually uh, struggle right from the port placement because you may uh, incur a lot of adhesions. So this is the vagus nerve and, and by that we, I mean that we are very close to the esophagus. Now we are trying to identify uh, the entire esophagus. First we'll, we, we will uh, identify the anterior as well as the posterior border, make a window or try making a window. You can actually sloop the esophagus at this stage so that it's, it becomes easy for you to retract.
come uh, one more important step i would suggest uh, what i would say at this point is once you this is the, we have identified the posterior border of the esophagus now we are actually if you see the diaphragm has been depressed you are not able to see the diaphragm because it is it has been depressed completely uh, with a ramp please or, or a sponge on a holder and this is the most important uh, step uh, to identify the thoracic duct because it is you know, it, much much below it is just above the diaphragmatic hiatus you can say you have to identify or try identifying the duct uh, or the tissues the fibro fatty tissues just against the vertebral bodies and behind staying behind the esophagus so here we were since i said uh, before this was a very we were very, very lucky or fortunate to have a virgin right side pleural cavity and we could see a thoracic duct and we were in a position to uh, delineate it so once identified it's a small very tiny uh, cord like structure but the ideal is always to have a two side two two side double ligation one yeah proximal as well as distal yes you may or may not divide it we uh, just uh, ligated it doubly i'm sorry yeah so like i said this was the pictorial image uh, this is the double ligation site just i just uh, staying just above the diaphragmatic hiatus in post esophagectomy this step is a routine step uh, whereby you can actually do it as a two sides so one proximal staying just below the azygous vein and one distally uh having said that this pro pro procedure should always be clubbed with a uh, on the site of the chylothorax it should always be uh, clubbed with a pleurodesis either mechanical or uh, chemical so a tal pleurodesis is rampantly or easily available easy to use and instill uh so it should be always done to get maximum results so you get best results or best successful outcomes in cases of post hypogenic cases at least 90 to 100% this patient uh, actually had a disappearance of the chyle uh, from the chest drainage right from the day 1 of uh, surgery i will have shared one slide extra uh, this can be of uh, interest to the general surgeon so this when in cases of failed uh, vas ligation or persistent or refractory chylothorax many people they do uh, advise uh, going to the trans abdominal approach now this is a very familiar uh, area for at least a general surgeons but however i would like to highlight some points uh, you can uh, you uh, address directly uh, to the cisterna chyli for uh, trans abdominal approach however you need to go absolutely behind the liver by dividing the uh, you know the coronary ligaments or the attachments of the liver and going ab absolutely retro it or retro hepatic there you would be able to identify cisterna chyli it is the landmark is it is just against or uh, the origin of this celiac artery so some people they do in cases of failed or persistent chylothorax or failed vas ligation they address as a second procedure in the form of a direct trans cisterna chyli ligation trans abdominally only this only you have to make uh, you have to make sure that you do not damage the celiac artery origin coming to some alternative therapies yes literature have mentioned some alternative therapies in uh, which can be favorable and can give a um, good outcome even if your uh, previous surgery has uh, failed like we can uh, even if, if if you're not able to find good planes or if you're not able to do a mice like mass ligation or a duct ligation you can just do a vas pleurectomy and come out or you could just do a pleurodesis and come out yes if it is a high output uh, chylothorax you could do a pleurovenous or a pleuroperitoneal shunt by shunting the fluid uh, from pleural cavity into the peritoneal cavity then uh, some uh, have also recommended a platelet rich plasma pleurodesis or blood pleurodesis it's very easy to do and uh, with ex excellent outcome and of course like i mentioned before thoracic uh, duct embolization these however for doing thoracic duct embolization you would definitely need a very very experienced uh, interventional radiology team coming to uh, the management algorithm like i said before it's a tip of iceberg so what you see you have to really indulge into a process to manage it 
first we start with the conservative management in the form of a chest strain and surgeon and putting the patient on a medium chain triglyceride diet. If it persists still, you, will, you would need to put the patient on uh, nil by mouth and uh, give a total, start a total parenteral nutrition. At this stage, you can actually think of doing a, to, a thoracic duct uh, embolization straightforward. If it stops, it's good. You can move the chest uh, drain after doing a talc pleurodesis. And you would need to continue with the medium chain triglyceride diet for at least six weeks. However, like I mentioned before, if it is a persistent chylothorax, a high, out high output chylothorax or a rapidly uh, increasing or uh, symptomatic patients for a long duration, then these are the ideal candidates for a uh, VATS ligation with pleurodesis. Coming to the last slide, it is which will show the schematic flow chart uh, of the candidates uh, to select. Oh, High volume chylothorax, uh, failed conservative or idiopathic uh, and congenital chylothorax mm -hmm. are straightforward cases for uh, operative mm -hmm. repair. Then post-surgical or post atrogenic or traumatic are again straightforward cases. And failed surgical ligation or unfit for general anesthesia are cases for you can consider for a thoracic duct embolization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shilpa. That was yeah. really one of the uh, nice presentations, and uh, I, I'm I'm very happy to connect with you again after so many years. Yes. <laughs> Shilpa used to be uh, my resident many 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 years back. Yeah, yeah ten years, almost <laughs> eight years back. Uh, yes. <laughs> So now we are moving to the uh, next session of uh, panel discussion. Before that, Dr. Ishwar Murthy would like to say a few words. And mm -hmm. because he has to connect uh, to the next webinar at some other place. Uh, over to Dr. Ishwar Murthy, please. Jay, Jay Shri, uh, good evening. You carry on with the panel discussion. I'll do it at the end, no problem. I like to look forward to your lecture before uh, I oh. do a word of dance. It will be more appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So, uh, Kritika, can you please uh, start with my presentation? <coughs> For this panel discussion, we are going to invite Dr. John Thanakumar, one of the very senior thoracoscopic surgeons from whom I learned my thoracoscopy maybe in the 90s, and all our faculty present here. Uh, to, uh, I request you all of you to please be a part of this panel discussion. The panel is going to be typically discussing about the <coughs> troubleshooting, the trouble prevention and management of complications of thoracoscopic surgery. So can you start with my presentation, please, Kritika? <coughs> uh, Dr. Jay, we do not have your presentation. I have sent it, no? Already. No, no, I, we have not received it. Oh, okay. No problem. I will start. Please, can you try it from your end? Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Okay. I will do it from here. <laughs> uh, so, before we get connected with the presentation, I, I have received some uh, questions for the panel, for the faculty. Uh, I would go ahead with the questions. The first question is about the practice of thoracoscopic surgery in the geriatric patients. I would like to take this uh, question to Dr. Ali Zamir Khan. Are you there, Doctor? I think you mentioned on the there, chat doctor? box earlier that uh, he's going to leave and then he's going to come back again because he had another meeting. OK, so no problem. Maybe I would uh, direct this question to uh, Dr. Sabita. Are you there? Yes, Dr. Jay, I'm there. So there is a question. In geriatric patients, what are the specific uh, conditions we will look upon in terms of the risk handling? And what are the indications where would you say that we won't do it in geriatric patients, the old patients? The thoracoscopic surgery works better for geriatric patients because you avoid a thoracotomy. So for the general workup of the patients, you would use the same criteria that you use for other patients. You would look at the lung function, the PFT as well as the DLCO. You would look at the cardiac function. But these uh, elderly people may also have been smokers for longer uh, periods of time. So you really need to look at your lung windows on your CT scan if there is any fibrosis, any evidence of adhesions. Then you will look at their comorbidities. 
So a lot of them can be on cardiac medication as well as uh, having pacemakers or undergone previous cardiac procedures. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, and also, um, there may be some people who are on blood thinners. So that also needs to be kept in mind. But all the evidence, there's no level one evidence, but there are large systematic reviews and the, the DACIA database, which shows that uh, thoracoscopic surgery actually works better for uh, geriatric patients and they are able to complete their adjuvant therapy, especially after lung resections. So uh, any geriatric patient definitely consider as a, a, a candidate for thoracoscopy. Thank you very much. I hope the delegates have received their answers. One question is uh, directed to Dr. Arun Prasad. How to look for left phrenic nerve from the right side during thymectomy? Yes. <laughs> yes. So when you are crossing over, you will reach the opposite side pleura. And then trying to avoid making a breach into the pleura, you have to go start going down inferiorly. And inferiorly, you will find a junction. So it's like the end of a room where the floor is the arch of aorta and the mediastinum. And the opposite side where the wall finishes, that's where at that junction you will see the left phrenic nerve. So you need to go for this, especially when you are doing cases of myasthenia gravis in a non-thymoma patient where you have to actually... Uh, recover the entire thymus gland as well as the fat and in this process even if you make a hole in the opposite pleura don't be scared and you don't even need to close that hole because after you have got rid of the carbon dioxide you will be able to uh, close it uh, <coughs> the space will close automatically okay thank you i hope the uh the delegates are able to uh, receive the messages and receive the uh, answers to their questions. The question to Dr. Jignesh Gandhi is, did the esophageal perforation heal spontaneously? And what yeah, was so the outcome of the patient finally? And how stormy was the, uh, was the post-operative phase? Yeah. So first of all, uh, in, in benign uh, esophageal conditions, one has to remember one thing very clearly that if you decompress the esophagus, keep the distal passage free, the perforations are going to heal. I have a short series also of Borhave syndrome, which is also a benign perforation. Even if they have contamination, once you take care of and drain the pus in that area, you keep the distal passage free. In all our patients of perforation, I usually put in a triple lemon freca tube now. So the trilumina tube works very well. It decompresses the stomach, it feeds the patient through the nasogeginal, and you give a good wash and you come out. These perforations heal very, very well. Very often, uh, you know, uh, it, it happens that, you know, sometimes we have to go in and we find that area. But let me tell you with experience that you try to take sutures there, they don't heal. Coming to this particular patient, yes, after we drained out, obviously, as I told you, that it is very difficult to find that pinhole or that small perforation, it is like finding a diamond in a pool of mud. It's a practically impossible. So you drain out that area well. She was in the hospital for about a week's time. But yes, for her to start her normal deglutition process without the NGFT tube, it took us around three weeks' time. So we had to wait for three weeks. After that, I did a contrary gram, uh, ascertained that there was no leak. That area had completely dried up in the mediastinum, and then she was started on orally. So usually it takes anywhere between three weeks to six weeks. In Borhave, my experience has been about six to eight weeks that they take uh, to decompress and dry out that area. And that's how it works well. Thank you. Dr. We have, uh, in addition to whatever Dr. Jignesh has very kindly clarified, we have used fibrin uh, glue right on top just to put it at the end. That's for small perforation. We have done that. That's one thing I was warned uh, that the people who are attending. You see, the suturing is not as easy as, as easy as in laparoscopy because you've got your instruments between two uh, ribs on either side. So you can see the hole. Sometimes you may have to even replace your trochas. So it's not as simple as it looks. So if it's small, probably just some sort of a washout and some spray should be done. But the bigger ones here, you might even have to put, we have also used uh, ornamental grafts from below. That works sometimes over the stitching. 
in in fact just to add on that dr john uh, you know i had to practice vertical suturing and doing the loops when i was working and doing my thoracoscopy because in abdomen you can do the horizontal suturing which we are all used to absolutely but in thoracic you have to do the vertical way which Correct. some of the japanese uh, people mention about it so that yeah. works very well sure. <laughs> yeah so now the next question uh it is for dr arun prasad where to insert the icg for lymphatic leak no sorry it is for dr shilpa gandhi where to insert the icg for lymphatic leak and how much before how much time before the surgery or during the surgery shilpa are you there uh, yes ma'am i'm i'm there uh, what so the icg question? But ah yes, I, I got the question. So yeah. ICG can be done. It can be done diagnostic or therapeutic both. Uh, if it is easily available, it should be ideally uh, given on the medial side or the medial foot, just against the first metatarsal in any small cube uh, mm -hmm. vein. It is not uh, very easy to do. Again, I said you know these kind of procedures they need a very experienced IR team also because finding that small vein and then you know installing the dye it's not very easy to do. Hence, many people they just do it as a uh, diagnostically to just delineate uh, the anatomy in the form of a CT lymphangiogram. Uh, I would definitely therefore there's a reason why I did not actually stress on it even on my talk. So the best uh, most easy way of uh, thoracic duct delineation is to give a high dose of at least 500 ml of cream through the uh, Ryle's tube. Just 15 to 20 minutes prior to the surgery, and you can you would be able to see the leak after that when you are on table. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we are moving to the panel discussion now. So this is. Uh, am I able to share my uh, slides? No. Are you able to see? No. Okay. Now? Nope. Okay. But we can see you well. Ah, uh, yeah. I know. Yeah. Now? No. Are you able to see that? No, no. The green button at the bottom, maybe. Yeah, something is happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your screen is on. Okay. But it is off at my end. It's okay. I will see it on the other end. Uh, so, uh, again, greetings from uh, IAGS and all the panelists towards the audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Raman Goyal, Dr. Uh, Sayanda, and Dr. Ishwar Muthi for being a big part and a uh, very big encouragement to carry on with this first ever thoracoscopic program in the IAGS uh, mentorship. We, I just wanted to say a few words because there were some, so many questions. We talked about the uh, how the thoracoscopic came in and what are the different indications. So I thought maybe I would put in some two, three slides about it. Uh, you can see here the first slide where thoracoscopy came as endoscopy of the interior of the chest way back in 1910 with the cystoscopes like all the rest of the uh, laparoscopes. In subsequent decades, the technique improved with two things. One, most important for thoracoscopy is introduction of separate lung ventilation, which could happen from the 1960s onwards. So allowing the procedures on a non-ventilated lung. And the second, of course, the video camera and the instrumentation, which could make us uh, make it very feasible, the VAS and the total thoracoscopic surgeries also. As far as the indications of the VATS are concerned, this is from 19... 92 till 2002, it was restricted to diagnostics, that is pleuroscopy, mediastinoscopy, lung biopsies, pleural biopsies, mediastinal biopsies, small thoracic procedures like the sympathectomy. Sorry, we missed that lecture today because Dr. Biswas could not join. But in the uh, next program, which is going to be A to Z about thoracoscopic surgery, 
which IAGS is planning in the month of November, we will have a little more uh, time and more extensive talks about the whole uh, about the whole thoracoscopy gamut. So small thoracoscopic procedures used to be sympathectomies, surgeries for pneumothorax, and splanchnectomies. After 2003, many things could come in as the large thoracoscopic procedures, including lobectomies, thymectomies, esophagectomies, the pneumonectomies, and many more. <coughs> now we are moving to the complications of thoracoscopic surgery, trouble prevention, and trouble management. Are you all able to see the slides now? We can't see your slides. You can you can ask your question. Forget the slides. You can ask your question. Okay. So uh, the complications of thoracoscopic surgery are first of all, it is not very, very frequent, estimated to be three to four percent in an experienced hand. Most frequent complication being the prolonged post-operative leak, bleeding, infections, the post-operative pain, and recurrence at the port side, not to forget the organ injuries. And many complications can be avoided by ensuring better selection of patient, better preparation of the patient, and the proper operative technique, including the positions. Can you say something? Oh. Yeah, sorry, sorry. You uh, see, the, the indication should be the same as an open surgery. It's not thoracoscopy. It's like you, we have been doing thoracoscopy since 1992. 93, we did a East facial mobilization. So the perforation rate is probably going to be the same. But lung complications are definitely less and the pain factor is less. Regarding the position, one more word I just wanted to say. We started the lateral position. We went on to prone, then went back to three-quarter prone position. But sometimes when the post-op, there is a problem. You want to check whether the esophagus is patent or not. Despite all the CT scans, you may still have to do a thoracoscopy, especially if you're doing a repeat thoracoscopy or a possible leak that doesn't subside. And if you want to know the location, sometimes you may have to go in with a thoracoscope. So remember, by positioning the patient, you should be able to put the scope in. And if you can't, put the scope in gently before. Sometimes even a bronchoscope becomes smaller. Gently put it in before you position the patient. That's something I thought I should mention. Oh, that is very true. Uh, the classification of surgical complications of thoracoscopy is done by Clavian and Dindo, where they classify it as per the grades. Grade one being non-life-threatening, non requiring any use of drugs, treated only with bedside interventions, do not lengthen the hospital stay longer than twice the median. <clears throat> Grade 2 will be the potentially life-threatening, requiring only drug therapy, total parental nutrition or transfusions. So maybe Grade 1 and Grade 2 are the ones where we should be vigilant in catching it up at the right time so that we can intervene at the right time. Grade 3 is life-threatening, requiring therapeutic imaging, or endoscopic procedure, or re-exploration. Grade 4 is classified as the complication with residual or lasting disability or objective signs of the life-threatening disease. Grade 5 being the death. So I understand that everybody here is being doing a lot of thoracoscopic surgeries of all the spans, all the grades of patients. So I would like to understand from the panelists just one one example of what kind of bad complication they came across, maybe what they can recall quickly and how did they handle. We start with maybe Dr. Sabita. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So, uh, anastomotic leak where most of your circumference of the anastomosis gives away, you will definitely need to do a disconnection. So, endoscopy is essential 
first to rule out uh, uh, stomach tube necrosis and also to see how much of the circumference has given away. So if your mediastinal leak, your collection is not uh, getting controlled with uh, radiology guided pigtails, then definitely do an endoscopy early. Okay. Uh, Dr. Anjali? Yes, Dr. Anjali? Well, I re can remember one azygous vein. If you're using the wrong instrumentation sometimes, which is a little more sharp, and you're trying to go behind the azygous vein, and you your angle of you know the dissection is not correct, you tend to cause friction and you can have an azygous vein injury. Luckily, we could clip it, but uh, you know, clips do come off in the chest. So it takes some time, sometimes some complications can be bad. Yeah, that's one I can remember of fan. So maybe you will recommend all the locking clips in the thorax? I will, but then when you have a complication and you don't have some things available at that exact moment and you've used a metal clip, it takes time for the locking clip to come in. <laughs> yes, yes. No, but I mean to start with yeah. the locking Yes, clip. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jignesh? Uh, I remember a case of uh, Borhave syndrome that uh, you know we had treated it primarily, but at that time we could not see the perforation edges very clearly. On the second instance, he got a collection again, and then when I had to go in for the second time, I can tell you, going mm -hmm. second time in a condition like this where you have uh, already passed first, the granulation tissue was just bleeding like hell. So in open, it is very easy. You know, you use a hydrogen peroxide pack and just put it in that area. But here, actually, I had to use a combination of, uh, you know, a spray coagulation. And I had to use tissil in that area, finally, to just spray in that area. And then there was a good hemostasis. So I think bleeding is one thing which in thoracoscopy, because of the limitations of putting things inside, uh, it's a little bit tricky. So one has to be ready with the sealant agents and hemostatic agents. Understand because these are the low volume, low pressure bleeding. I always talk about that the surgeon is always worried about low volume, low pressure bleeding because there is no solution to that. And it, it just keeps on irritating and it comes at the last part of the surgery whenever it comes in. So even if you take a stitch, you are worried it's a raw area. So use of, use of sealants uh, should be in the armamentarium of the surgeons when they are using uh, doing thoracoscopic work. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Dr. Shilpa? Uh, you are on the mute, my dear. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, what is the question? Uh, I just lost the stink of this. Uh... No, we just wanted to understand the uh, very bad complication which you have come across. And maybe what do you think should be the preventive measures? Uh, As a message. You can think about it. Maybe I'll go to Arun Prasad first. You can think about it and get back to us. Okay. But I have I've come across the most dreaded complication is during a lobectomy, and that is uh, very recently. In fact, here we have come across, and that is the injury to any of the pulmonary artery uh, branches. I mean, it's the most dreaded, and we have very recently come across to it. But uh, if you are not good in suturing techniques by VATS, uh, then it is very difficult to. Uh, handle these kind of complications. You have to straightforward convert it. Otherwise, you can. Uh, you have that's the, that's the only fallacy of VATS actually. And uh, progression from basic VATS surgeon to an advanced VATS surgeon. You should always be a uh, very good in your hand uh, suturing techniques so that you can uh, deal with these dreaded complications. Otherwise, you would uh, land up in uh, converting it into a thoracotomy and then actually uh, suturing it with a floor zero proline sutures. And we have recently come across this this uh, patient just two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah uh, we understand that bleeding in thorax can be one of the very hilarious complications. Right. And uh, what what is difference uh, between the laparoscopy and thoracoscopy is, even though the rigid wall helps us in terms of creating the pressure and, you know, staying on with uh, without any collapse of the pneumothorax, still, it is very difficult when it comes to any emergency handling and typically the suturing because yeah. in various positions there is no elastic wall which can help you in terms of movement. Yes, you have to know the thoracic anatomy first well yes. before in hand. You should have a backup of open thoracoscopic surgery anytime you uh, wish to go ahead. And of course you should read the radiologically uh, the images first 
in a proper way so that you don't land up into uh, troublesome situations that's very true dr arun prasad will you be able to share some few uh, one of the cases which you remember as the you know tough things as complication are you there arun so amol dr amol yeah so yeah. Uh, two cases i remember uh, one was a wax left upper lobectomy one of my first few cases at hinduja uh, we were we started somewhere in the evening and uh, were almost about to finish the case by about 9 pm and uh, uh, i i had finished the entire hyalur dissection uh, and it was for an aspergilloma so there were dense adhesions at the apex but uh, uh, in wax uh, usually there is one Uh, tip to keep the apical adhesions in place, finish off the fistula and hilar dissection, and then go to the apex at the end because you know uh, it helps to keep the lung, the lobe retracted with those adhesions. So towards the end, I was uh, uh, I was I was dealing with these apical adhesions, pretty dense ones, and uh, uh, I my camera was in the inferior port, so uh, probably just the last bit was left, but there, that adhesion was. uh to the densely adherent to the subclavian artery and uh, i tried to divide it with a harmonic not uh, shifting my uh, telescope to the anterior port to get better vision which i realized i should have done later on and i ended up injuring the subclavian artery so uh, we had to the, the patient almost uh, crashed and <coughs> i had to quickly convert but luckily we managed to save the patient uh clamp the vessel and uh, to my to my uh, fortune uh, a, a vascular surgeon was just finishing a case in the next theater so he came in to help me and uh, then we we could uh, repair the subclavian artery so that is one complication i remember and second one was uh, i was again it was a left upper lobectomy again for an aspergilloma in uh, this was actually a, a, a live uh, surgery uh, going out from my own theater and there uh, uh, after after uh, putting the vascular stapler onto the superior pulmonary vein uh, the, the it got fired but while removing it the vessel got avulsed and there again we had a tough time opening and then uh, controlling that that bleeding So these are two complications which I distinctly remember. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Doctor John, you can tell us about whether uh, tumors are better than the infections to be treated thoracoscopically. Uh, uh, sorry, say that again. Uh, maybe you can tell us about in the beginners. whether infections are better to be treated thoracoscopically or the uh, tumors um uh, well i think both can be but depends for instance if we take an mpema acute mpema does not require any thoracoscopy probably need some aspiration and you know the timing is so important if you leave it after 3 weeks become chronic mpema no the like, thoracoscopic surgeon is going to take it out because it just won't expand it needs complete tearing which is probably most probably impossible through the laparoscope and so the ultimate result is to see whether the chest opens i mean these are all things we discovered nobody taught us uh, and the other thing is uh, about the uh, tumors again if you're going to operate on ca esophagus I, i mean i'm basically from bellur trained by uh, 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 you know uh, adelaide australia uh, professor glemison and all these people you see the thing is they are guys who treated ca esophagus especially squamous cell with chemo radio and the whole thing subsides so they have an endoscopy so that sort of a patient was endoscopy ct scan pet scan there's nothing there no need to do anything at all no need for surgery but if there is any residual tumor any evidence of a tumor if you're going to do open surgery thoracoscopy if you're good your team is good it's useful but sometimes if you send it, send it to the wrong people and they fry the esophagus life is hell so it depends on the team depends on where you are working and also the stage of the disease where it requires surgery it needs a very mature decision 
and very often it's multiple people have to take part in the decision it's not that you're a top cat and you can you know you're you're a very highly trained pilot you can go into any mission you got to gauge the whole thing if you basically i think one must be a good doctor and a good surgeon to take a very considered decision with your colleagues only then you should go in and they even then discuss all the complications and tell the patient for instance our first isa box was 1993 and initially we told the patient we have never done one before we have only this read the description of kuchiari so when we started doing our uh, recurrent lesion especially on left side was slightly there do thoracoscopy we have sort of clearing because the scopes are quite uh, not very good those days we had single chip but then digital camera digital imaging was very good at that time you know was considered good but later on i realized my dissection while doing the cervical esophagus with my finger was the one that damaged the nerve not my thoracoscopy i mean it's a stupid complication thinking about it so these are all things by which we learned sometimes the other member of the team is very important i don't usually operate neurosurgeons but i think once we got the neurosurgeon to come in he's a very good friend of my my wife's classmate so you know he saw me doing the whole thing there we were doing decortication and there were more than three ribs and three vertebrae involved so he said he is going to put a thing and screw so somewhere he said john i will take over and he took the forceps and just i said be careful and he jammed it into the intercostal artery the bleeding was a torrential the my first assistant just held on to the artery and then used the suction the lung kept falling in blah 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 but the assistant caught the artery in time so that's why the team is very important as well it's just not the surgeon alone maybe a nurse maybe even a car driver but the team is very important depend on how much you trained others all this has to be considered we're looking at uh, uh, infections and uh, malignancy yeah so uh, i would like to direct the, uh, this question to dr bhushan tobre also what will be your advice as a beginner which kind of thoracoscopic operations people can opt for yes uh, first of all i would say <clears throat> you should have observed ample of uh, surgeries uh, I, uh, as an assistant uh, to a th thoracic surgeon nearby certified thoracic surgeon nearby or the best method is you have to get yourself enrolled into some training program uh, if at all that is not possible you are too old to undergo training you can undergo somewhere observership where high volume uh, thoracic surgery wide variety of work is done and after that then you can contemplate some diagnostic thoracoscopics like for pleural effusions malignant pleural effusions where uh, pleural <laughs> biopsies and then eventually uh, going on for pneumothoraxes where the patients are uh, very carefully selected where you should not have any mishap or any complication for first 100 or to 200 cases that will gain your patient database uh, confidence and even general public acceptability where you find that you are not capable of uh, doing any heroic work or any uh, 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 much advanced work then you can definitely refer to your nearby expert thoracic surgeon <laughs> that is the uh, in general advice i would like to give for the beginners who would like to start thoracoscopy So uh, my next question is directed to Dr. Uh, Khan. No, Are you there, Dr. Khan? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm just yeah. logged in. Thank you. So uh, one question: What is there any indication for emergency thoracoscopic surgery? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is every indication for emergency thoracoscopic surgery. Uh -huh. The bottom line is, I, I'm, I'm not understand your question is uh, indications of. uh vats in trauma that that's the question you asked uh -huh. i'm assuming so yes we do um uh, we do uh, do vats in trauma uh, but uh, first and foremost is that the patient should be stable a b c d e has to be followed uh, you, you cannot try to save uh, you cannot try to do vats and lose a patient so you you must follow the a b c d e principles uh stabilize the patient to make sure he is hemodynamically stable get him into theater hemothorax usually uh, i i actually manage by vats uh, most of the hemothorax i would go in by vats uh, try to suck out the blood and uh, look at whatever is the uh, <laughs> source of bleeding uh, we have managed bleedings from intercostal arteries bleeding from ima uh, bleeding from uh, pulmonary arteries uh, but of course uh, you need a bit of experience to do that 
in a trauma situation, if you're not experienced, then you should not be putting in uh, cameras into the chest. Uh, an open thoracotomy will save a patient's life. But if you're experienced, and uh, now we, we almost invariably always start any surgery with a camera in the chest. And you'll be surprised how well you can take everything down. And you can suck the blood out. Uh, vision is the main thing. So we've also done uh, VATS, uh, uh, tra traumatic injury to uh, bronchus, right main bronchus, <coughs> VATS traumatic injury to uh, the trachea, where you just go in and put a couple of stitches around. Uh, but the patient has to be stable. If the patient is not stable, just do an open surgery. Because you need a live patient at the end of the thing. It's not about VATS. It's about getting a live patient at the other end. Uh, what we have found is in our practice, penetrating injuries of the neck, of the abdomen, and of the thorax, all three places. Uh, diagnostic thoracoscopy has helped us go ahead with the right decision making in terms of which area needs exploration. I think some of the things which that is one of the situations where I say that all general surgeons should should be well acquainted with the minimum diagnostic thoracoscopies because that is something which can save a lot at the patient's end if done at the right point of time now we move to the next level of thing that is about bleeding bleeding is something which can come to any surgeon in a very particular way in terms of control which can be a little tough maybe few things are already discussed about bleeding so i want to like to go ahead with a lot of discussion about bleeding uh, many surgeons have already talked about it i will go ahead with the prolonged air leak so this is one thing which can create a lot of nuisance in the post-operative phase of any thoracoscopic surgeon's life so dr bhanu shali would you like to talk about it uh, you have covered a few things, so I said it's a good idea that you talk about it. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question? Can you be louder, Amun? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, now, better. Yeah, uh, so I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question? See, prolonged air leak is something which can create a lot of nuisance in the post operative phase of any thoracoscopic surgeon. So what, should, what is the uh, definition of prolonged air leak? How should be the approach? Are there any grades? Can you please talk about it? So uh, yeah, prolonged air leak is, uh, uh, is a nagging thing uh, for every thoracic surgeon, uh, especially if you if you have to send the patient home with a tube, uh, you are not very happy with uh, with doing that. Uh, and every 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 surgeon wants every patient to go home with the tube removed uh, before discharge. But uh, at times you do experience prolonged air leak uh, uh, in few procedures, especially uh, the things like decortications for, for uh, chronic empyemas. Uh, so. There, as I mentioned during my talk, uh, uh, during the procedure, make sure that uh, significant air leaks are managed then and there uh, by by suturing or by by whatever uh, technique you want to. Uh, make sure the lung is fully expanded. If the lung doesn't expand completely and uh, stick to the chest wall, if there is a space left behind, uh, then uh, uh, these air leaks uh, uh, tend to uh, keep uh, continuing. So, uh, in short, the decortication has to be thorough enough for the lung to fully expand and stick to the chest wall. Uh, then the chance of having a prolonged air leak is is lesser. If you still have it, uh, usually most of them are going to stop uh, by keeping the tube for a slightly longer time. So the tube can be connected to something called as a flutter bag or a hemlick wall. Hemlick wall is not uh, so very commonly available. So you can just connect it to uh, a urine bag with a non-return valve. Uh, I, I in fact learned this from Dr. Khan himself uh, that you, uh, you can use this uh, a simple urine connected to the tube and you can send the patient home uh, uh, with that. And uh, usually these these leaks tend to stop within 
a week or so, week or two, and then once the uh, lung is well expanded on the subsequent X-ray, and there is no uh, plucking of the bag uh, later on, you can remove the tube. Uh, another trick is to use uh, negative suction uh, at the end of the procedure. So connect the ICD tube to negative suction right at the end of the procedure. Uh, the maximum pressure you can use is minus 20 centimeters of uh, XO. And uh, uh, I have been uh, I have been doing that uh, since the last about three to four years, uh, especially since I uh, procured the Medila digital negative uh, suction device. So uh, I have been using that for uh, almost each and every procedure. Uh, it helps to keep the lung expanded. Helps to keep the lung uh, stick back to the uh, removed parietal pleura or if you if you turn a pleurodesis, whatever. It helps to keep the lung expanded and uh, uh, helps to re reduce and uh, go get away with the leak faster. So these are a couple of uh, tips that I can share. Okay, nice. Thank you very much for sharing this. I think next time we should have one good session on lung diabetes because it's a very, very important thing to talk about. Infections, as we all know that uh, it can accompany any of the surgeries. And typically, I won't go into a lot of details because here you know, the management remains the same like any other infections. Only thing is you have to be careful about the collapsing lung and uh, developing uh, uh, developing impairments. So I think that can be very worrisome situation. But this is a very preventable thing. As uh, Dr. Amol said, the expanded lung is the answer for many questions as far as the thorax is concerned. The next complication which we find is post-operative pain. And can I just raise a question about your previous slide? Yes. You are saying that the prophylactic use of antibiotics is controversial. Actually, antibiotic prophylaxis is highly recommended and highly well studied uh, within the uh, thoracic surgery area. But we are not talking about uh, use of antibiotics over a prolonged period of time. We're talking about either a single dose antibiotic at the time of induction or a three course of antibiotics, three doses of antibiotics. Kefiroxin, 750 milligrams, half an hour before incision. Uh, and if the surgery is more than three hours, then give a second dose. And if you're worried about, uh, you know, blood loss and things, you give a third dose post-operatively at eight hours. And that is very, very well studied and very well documented. It is actually not controversial. When okay. you say prophylactic use, you mean to use antibiotics at random? That is not allowed. But a prophylactic antibiotic prophylaxis is very much part of VATS. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing this. And uh, next time it will be changed in the slide. Uh, Post-operative pain. People do come across the minimally, do opt for minimally invasive surgeries for typically the pain reduction. Pain becomes a very big part of the story when somebody is there in pain and not liking it. It is a st statistically significant uh, thing when a patient's dissatisfaction index is concerned. So maybe Anjali, can you tell us about uh, post-operative pain? What kind of particular, some three or four points which you would like to take care in these patients? As one thing is the intercostal nerve injury. Of course, everybody has talked about it, how to avoid the injury. What are the other things you would like to talk about? <laughs> or maybe any of the panelists who want to share about it. I understand Anjali was not well for some time. Anjali is a COVID warrior and she is recovering out of that. So take it cool, Anjali. Anybody who can share about post-operative pain, most welcome, including yourself. Yeah, post-operative pain, usually it starts with the uh, uh, crimes done in the theater while operating. So uh, that's the most important way of reducing your post-operative pain is by being careful about how you handle your instruments and how you go in <coughs> into the chest to avoid the post-operative pain. Of course, some people are more sensitive to post-operative pains. Local infiltration is extremely important and uh, also um, having your uh, a good anesthetist 
will be able to manage your post operative pain either using some kind of blocks or uh, using some kind of uh, uh, pain suppression <laughs> medications so i don't know apart from that whether uh, anything specific specific for the thorax no yeah well, we we have a protocol for pain management number one is that you have to uh, intraoperatively make sure you don't use hard uh, what do you call it uh, uh, what in the world now uh, hard ports in fact in thoracic surgery you should not use any ports <coughs> wherever your instruments are going in and out you should not use ports you must use a uh, just a wound retractor or wound protector so that your instruments go in and out pretty well or put in stitches to leave the wound open the use of pre uh, we have studied the use of uh, preemptive analgesia and we found that that actually definitely reduces pain early use of trans thermal patches has been uh, recommended in my unit we use uh, mm -hmm. buprenorphine or fentanyl patch and very quickly get rid of the pain you have to break the chronic pain cycle and we have also studied the use of long term if the patient goes into pain uh, four to six weeks after the surgery when the wound has healed then we use yoga and local uh, oil uh, ayurvedic oil medications over the wound and that actually we have published that data showing that that reduces uh, post operative pain you must treat the vats wound as a thoracotomy wound whether you like it or not you must give it the same respect and uh, you know you must make sure that the intercostal neurovascular bundle is not compromised that's the key thing yeah thank you very much uh, maybe dr sabita would be able to add few things about the protocol for post operative pain you people are doing lot of major major surgeries in tata hospital and uh, what is your any particular pain protocol if you can share you are muted so for typically for esophageal uh, thoracoscopic surgeries we would still use an epidural but not for mediastinal and uh, lung resections because lung resections we are mostly doing uniportal now so we infiltrate the port site we also our anesthetists also uh, give paravertebral clocks and uh, <coughs> in the post operative uh, period if you notice it is the icd which gives more intercostal drainage tube which gives more pain to the patient than the incision itself so you have to have an aggressive eras protocol in place where you start mobilization chest physiotherapy and get rid of the tubes once you get rid of the tubes the incision for a vats usually does not give that much pain so use as small uh, tubes as you can and get rid of them early okay nice uh the recurrence at the port site is one thing which is uh, one of the connected complications as far as the technique is concerned the risk of this complication may rise in treatment of uh, some particular things like the uh, metastasis or the malignant pleural effusions something like this special aggressiveness it needs to be done in those particular conditions so typically i wanted to understand from dr sabita is there anything in particular you try to apply or maybe shilpa you can add here if you try, want to apply few things to avoid the recurrence at the port site so the first thing is that always use a bag however small your specimen is even if you think it will slip out of your wound protector even if you are using a wound protector always use a bag to retrieve an oncological specimen sometimes you may do a procedure take a, take a wedge of the lung thinking it's a benign thing and the final histopathology may be different so always use a bag and uh, also in cases like you mentioned in your slide mesothelioma so mesothelioma typically the port site metastases are the uh, sites which are used for intercostal drainage so you should remember not to put icds in a mesothelioma if there is a pleural effusion with a thickened pleura uh, drain it then try and do a ultrasound or a ct guided biopsy or you can also do a thoracoscopic biopsy but you have to be very very careful, careful in the case of mesothelioma so vats as we have been using bags like for the last 10 15 years and we have not seen any port site metastases okay uh, maybe shilpa i would like to uh, give you some other uh, other complication or maybe you can say a uh, question mark when a surgeon is operating 
I'm not going into a lot of details about the typical lung biopsy, wedge resection, bleeding, air leak infections, because this is covered. Anatomical resection of the lung also, we have covered many of the things in the common complications. But this is something which can be one of the difficult things, difficulty finding a tumor or the pathology. You are in the thorax and you are unable to find it. What should be the uh, strategies to avoid it or on table, how should you deal with it? First, uh, Dr. Shilpa and then Dr. Uh, John Thanakumar, if you can add to the... These are last two, three questions only. Uh, so, uh, yes, rightly said, difficulty in finding a tumor while you are uh, doing a VAT surgery. So you can one avoid this by doing a pre-operative localization by a detailed, uh, starting right from the basics, detailed uh, reading and co correlating the radiological findings. Secondly, you can do a needle localization just prior to taking the uh, patient uh, on table. So you could uh, do it CT guided or the, there are uh, needles, radioscopic uh, needles, which are uh, available in certain interventional uh, in IR teams. So you can use that. Uh, thirdly, when on table, uh, okay, and uh, in very advanced centers, I'm not very sure uh, that it, it is practiced in India, but in very advanced centers, yes, ICG die again. It has been very helpful in uh, localizing uh, these tumors. But there is a way, there is a software you need to uh, actually, you know, subtract it and uh, find out the exact segment or the lobe where the where the tiny SPN is uh, located. Thirdly, uh, on table, if it's a surprise, it shouldn't be a situation which uh, be, be, which would be very alarming because if made a utility port incision, it's at least three to four centimeters long. You can actually put in your index finger inside and palpate the entire lobe and try to correlate it with the radiological finding. And you should be able to at least, even if it's a tiny tumor, there could be a scarring or... It, you will actually is a palpage, palpatory technique. You know, you will be able to find a difference between a normal lung parenchyma and the suspicious uh, <laughs> segment or the lobe. So okay. these are the uh, various methods of finding the small or tiny lesions in the lung when you are doing a VATS or a wedge biopsy. So I think whenever we are doing any thoracoscopic procedure, like the laparoscopy, we have to take SOS open uh, consent for the on table in case needed right yes now and maybe ah uh, yes please yeah nothing uh, this is this is actually one of the indications of uh, converting a patient from vats to open even if it is a small ggo there are su surgeons who are when, when they are not satisfied and you know even with a intra operative palpation of the tiny uh, ggo they have converted it successfully and you know done a segmentectomy or a lobectomy even for a very tiny ggo of say 8 mm so this is a very uh, direct indication for conversion to open that is, would that like is to nice add to, to it. Uh, if at all you are uh, intra-op, if you are unable to get the tumor, you can extend the same incision, make the lung available to your finger. That is what. Free the inferior pulmonary ligament, release all the additions, make the lung available to your finger, do the proper finger palpation. If still not getting, you can make another port. Don't hesitate to make another port in the back side where you can feel the tumor. If still not, then you can uh, do an open uh, procedure. When all other methods fail, then ultimate is the diagnosis. Get a frozen section done. Confirm that you are have taken the right node. Can I just add to that? Sometimes yes, you can use anesthetist to bag the patient or collapse lung. If you have bilumen tube, uh, I mean, uh, bilumen tube, it's fantastic because they can collapse it just outside uh, the exit wall where it comes out and open the thing completely and put in a suction, make sure it's completely evacuated, you can see. Because initially for the new uh, thoracoscopic surgeon, everything will look like a nodule on the lung, on a collapsed lung. So this way it will be completely empty. And then you can feel it. Very often it would have collapsed. Make them blow it, feel it. And as has been rightly said, add a port if you're still not sure. Make a localized conversion. I wouldn't do a formal conversion. Make a localized conversion, see whether you can get it. Get a frozen organized, all that is. Yes. Thank you very much. That was really a good insight. I have one personal experience uh, to share with. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one time we had a, one, a nodule. 
yeah which was very difficult to palpate we lost our uh, look hello hello can't hear we can't hear can you hear me hello hello are you able to hear me we can hear you madam we can hear you but not him uh, but not him exactly. okay so i think uh, maybe once he can talk we will hear uh, listen to him there are few more things which uh, i am not going to discuss because every speaker has uh, included this in their topics and it is already been uh, touched upon upon the sympathetic tummy and the splanchnic uh, splanchnic tummy the things are not discussed but i think uh, these are the common uh, complications apart from the common bleeding and uh, pneumothorax complications we are able to see here the horner syndrome needs to be dealt with in a very very particular way but i won't be covering it maybe one of the speakers can talk about it i don't have much experience about this horner syndrome can somebody tell us about just few lines i think honor syndrome consists of five things as we know i don't know how to treat it once you get it you had it you tell the reassure the patient wait for it to go away and probably would refer it to neurologist but anhydrosis and partial anophthalmos neosis uh, and uh, what else the last sweating is there yeah pressure normally dilates it won't dilate and the last fifth point i forget Those so i think it's a uh, good vigilance Absolutely. good observation of the post operative patient is very important in this we won't yeah. be discussing much about it even uh, upon the esophagus we are not going to discuss many things uh, i would like to say thanks a lot to all my faculty to iags dr raman goel dr ishwar murthy and dr sayanda who have been instrumental in creating this first ever program in the thoracoscopic surgery like the abc and the master class uh, i have been behind the igs team since more than a year now for this and i find myself lucky to get introduced uh, with this topic to the igs audience over to dr ishwar murthy now thank you thank you jaya can you see my slides Yes. Uh, just the last I'll take. Uh, it's really wonderful. My I have the pleasant duty of giving what up thanks for all the faculties. I think this is the fifth and final IAGS master class by the IAGS Academic Council today for thoracoscopic surgery for general surgeons. I think uh, Jay, I need to thank you. You put all the five important concepts, laying the foundation, getting the basics right. thoracoscopy for the lung non lung and trying to bring all the 15 faculties on board trying to discuss all the complications i think i need to say greetings from our president the brahman goel and all the galaxy we see in particular we have right now with you our uh, chief advisor dr john tanakumar one of the senior most thoracoscopic surgeon in india and uh, thank you all the faculties i think you would have seen your uh, Uh, feedbacks but the, the feedbacks i received to iags website it's awesome lectures simply superb great selection of faculty wow treasure to save and share so these are all the feedbacks so i'm sure uh, we should thank you all jayashree it is only for, not only for you a certificate of appreciation already knocking your door but everybody would be receiving one in their phone already thank you all and uh, people who not able to see the last few parts they can go for iags connect because we have iags youtube channel facebook page twitter and also www.iagsjn you can see all the five master class videos are waiting for you to see again and again any time and we have to salute our warriors both at the borders and also all of us trying to do day and night fight the covid pandemic and not to forget docs plexus kritika nitish kumar all the people because we are going to be with them next week 9 pm 
with IHS prime time, one of the memorable occasion we are going to have with Professor Udwadiya, a father of laparoscopy in India, our founder president, speaking to Alfred Pusheri for one hour. So it will be a very, very memorable occasion. Please, all of you, all the delegates, please join. <laughs> and uh, the subsequent month in October also, pin in your calendar, 15th and 16th, we are having Indo-UK Sajikon. So until then, thank you, Jayashree. Thank you, faculty. Thank you, Talkplexes. Bye-bye. Goodbye from IAGS office.